Section 1 of 1891 Collection Impressions of American Hotels by Max O'Rell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. 1891 Collection by Various. Section 1 Impressions of American Hotels by Max O'Rell from A Frenchman in America, Recollections of Men and Things. Boston, January 6. Arrived here this afternoon and resumed acquaintance with American hotels. American hotels are all alike. Some are worse. Describe one and you have described them all. On the ground floor, a large entrance hall strewed with cuspidors for the men, and a side entrance provided with a triumphal arch for the ladies. On this floor, the sexes are separated as at the public baths. In the large hall, a counter behind which solemn clerks, whose business faces relax not a muscle, are ready with their book to enter your name and assign you a number. A small army of colored porters ready to take you in charge not a salute not a word not a smile of welcome the negro takes your bag and makes a sign that your case is settled you follow him for the time being you lose your personality and become number three hundred and seventy five as you would in jail don't ask questions theirs not to answer don't ring the bell to ask for a favor if you set any value on your time. All the rules of the establishment are printed and posted in your bedroom. You have to submit to them. No question to ask. You know everything. Henceforth, you will have to be hungry from 7 to 9 a.m., from 1 to 3 p.m., from 6 to 8 p.m. The slightest infringement of the routine would stop the wheel, so don't ask if you could have a meal at four o'clock. You would be taken for a lunatic, or a crank, as they call it in America. Between meals, you will be supplied with ice water ad libitum. No privacy, no coffee room, no smoking room. No place where you can go and quietly sip a cup of coffee or drink a glass of beer with a cigar. You can have a drink at the bar and then go and sit down in the hall among the crowd. Life in an American hotel is an alternation of the cellular system during the night and of the gregarious system during the day, an alternation of the penitentiary systems carried out at philadelphia and at auburn it is not in the bedroom either that you must seek anything to cheer you the bed is good but only for the night the room is perfectly nude not even napoleon's farewell to his soldiers at fontainebleau as in france or strafford walking to the scaffold as in england not that these pictures are particularly cheerful still they break the monotony of the wallpaper here the only oases in the brown or gray desert are cautions first of all i notice that in a cupboard near the window you will find some twenty yards of coiled rope which in case of fire you are to fix to a hook outside the window the rest is guessed you fix the rope and you let yourself go from a sixth, seventh, or eighth story, the prospect is lively. Another caution informs you all that you must not do, such as your own washing in the bedroom. Another warns you that if, on retiring, you put your boots outside the door, you do so at your own risk and peril. Another is posted near the door, close to an electric bell. With a little care and practice, you will be able to carry out the instructions printed thereon. The only thing wonderful about the contrivance is that the servants never make mistakes. 
Press once for ice water. Press twice for hall boy. Press three times for fireman. Press four times for chambermaid. Press five times for hot water. Press six times for ink and writing materials. Press seven times for baggage. Press eight times for messenger. In some hotels, I have seen the list carried to number 12. Another notice tells you what the proprietor's responsibilities are and at what time the meals take place. Now, this last notice is the most important of all. Woe to you if you forget it. For if you should present yourself one minute after the dining room door is closed, no human consideration would get it open for you. Supplications, arguments would be of no avail, not even money. What do you mean? Some old-fashioned European will exclaim. When the table de haute is over, of course you cannot expect the menu to be served to you, but surely you can order a steak or a chop. No, you cannot, not even an omelette or a piece of cold meat. If you arrive at one minute past three, in small towns at one minute past two, you find the dining room closed, and you must wait till six o'clock to see its hospitable doors open again. When you enter the dining room, you must not believe that you can go and sit where you like. The chief waiter assigns you a seat, and you must take it. With a superb wave of the hand, he signs to you to follow him. He does not even turn round to see if you are behind him, following him in all the meanders he describes, amid the sixty, eighty, sometimes hundred tables that are in the room. He takes it for granted you are an obedient, submissive traveler who knows his duty. Altogether, I traveled in the United States for about ten months, and I never came across an American so daring, so independent, as to actually take any other seat than the one assigned to him by that tremendous potentate, the head waiter. Occasionally, just to try him, I would sit down in a chair I took a fancy to, but he would come and fetch me and tell me that I could not stay there. In Europe, the waiter asks you where you would like to sit. In America, you ask him where you may sit. He is a paid servant, therefore a master in America. He is in command, not of the other waiters, but of the guests. Several times, Recognizing friends in the dining room, I asked the man to take me to their tables. I should not have dared go by myself, and the permission was granted with a patronizing sign of the head. I have constantly seen Americans stop on the threshold of the dining room door and wait until the chief waiter had returned from placing a guest to come and fetch them in their turn. I never saw them venture alone and take an empty seat without the sanction of the waiter. The guests feel struck with awe in that dining room and solemnly bolt their food as quickly as they can. You hear less noise in an American hotel dining room containing 500 people than you do at a French table d'hote accommodating 50 people, at a German one containing a dozen guests, or at a table where two Italians are dining tete-a-tete. -tete. The head waiter at large northern and western hotels is a white man. In the southern ones, he is a mulatto or a black. But white or black, he is always a magnificent specimen of his race. There is not a ghost of a savor of the serving man about him. No whiskers and shaven upper lips reminding you of the waiters of the old world, but always a fine moustache, the twirling of which helps to give an air of nonchalant superiority to its wearer. The mulatto head-waiters in the South really look like dusky princes. Many of them are so handsome and carry themselves so superbly that you find them very impressive at first, and would fain apologize to them. 
You feel as if you wanted to thank them for kindly condescending to concern themselves about anything so commonplace as your seat at table. In smaller hotels, the waiters are all waitresses. The waiting is done by damsels entirely, or rather by the guests of the hotel. If the southern head waiter looks like a prince, what shall we say of the head waitress in the east, the north, and the west? No term short of queenly will describe her stately bearing as she moves about among her bevy of reduced duchesses. She is evidently chosen for her appearance. She is divinely tall, as well as most divinely fair, and, as if to add to her importance, she is crowned with a gigantic mass of frizzled hair. All the waitresses have this coiffure. It is a livery, as caps are in the old world. But, instead of being a badge of servitude, it looks, and is, alarmingly emancipated. So much so that, before making close acquaintance with my dishes, I always examine them with great care. A beautiful mass of hair looks lovely on the head of a woman, but one in your soup, even if it had strayed from the tresses of your beloved one, would make the corners of your mouth go down and the tip of your nose go up. A regally handsome woman always goes well in the landscape, as the French say and I have seen specimens of these waitresses so handsome and so commanding-looking that, if they care to come over to Europe and play the queens in London pantomimes, I feel sure they would command quite exceptional prices and draw big salaries and crowded houses. The thing which strikes me most disagreeably in the American hotel dining room is the sight of the tremendous waste of food that goes on at every meal. No European, I suppose, can fail to be struck with this, but to a Frenchman it would naturally be most remarkable. In France, where, I venture to say, people live as well as anywhere else, if not better, there is a horror of anything like waste of good food. It is to me, therefore, a repulsive thing to see the wanton manner in which some Americans will waste at one meal enough to feed several hungry fellow creatures. In the large hotels, conducted on the American plan, there are rarely fewer than fifty different dishes on the menu at dinner time. Every day, and at every meal, you may see people order three times as much of this food as they could under any circumstances eat and, after picking it and spoiling one dish after another, send the bulk away uneaten. I am bound to say that this practice is not only to be observed in the hotels, where the charge is so much per day, but in those conducted on the European plan, that is, where you pay for every item you order. There I notice that people proceed in much the same wasteful fashion, it is evidently not a desire to have more than is paid for, but simply a bad and ugly habit. I hold that about five hundred hungry people could be fed out of the waste that is going on at such large hotels as the Palmer House or the Grand Pacific Hotel of Chicago, and I have no doubt that such five hundred hungry people could easily be found in Chicago every day. I think that many Europeans are prevented from going to America by an idea that the expense of traveling and living there is very great. This is quite a delusion. For my part, I find that hotels are as cheap in America as in England, at any rate, and railway traveling in Pullman cars is certainly cheaper than in European first-class carriages, and incomparably more comfortable. Put aside in America such hotels as Delmonico's, the Brunswick in New York, the Richelieu in Chicago, and in England such hotels as the Metropole, the Victoria, the Savoy, and take the good hotels of the country, such as the Grand Pacific at Chicago, the West House at Minneapolis, the Windsor at Montreal, the Cadillac at Detroit. 
I only mention those I remember as the very best. In these hotels, you are comfortably lodged and magnificently fed for from three to five dollars a day. In no good hotel of England, France, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, would you get the same amount of comfort, or even luxury, at the same price, and those who require a sitting room get it for a little less than they would have to pay in a European hotel. The only very dear hotels I have come across in the United States are those of Virginia. There I have been charged as much as two dollars a day, but never in my life did I pay so dear for what I had. Never in my life did I see so many dirty rooms or so many messes that were unfit for human food. But I will just say this much for the American refinement of feeling to be met with. Even in the hotels of Virginia, even in the lunch rooms in small stations, you are supplied at the end of each meal with a bowl of water to rinse your mouth. End of section one Impressions of American Hotels by Max O'Rell. Section number two of eighteen ninety one collection A Scandal in Bohemia by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. 1891 Collection by Various. Section 2. Part 1 of A Scandal in Bohemia. To Sherlock Holmes, she is always the woman. I have seldom heard him mention her under any other name. In his eyes she eclipses and predominates the whole of her sex. It was not that he felt any emotion akin to love for Irene Adler. All emotions, and that one particularly, were abhorrent to his cold, precise, but admirably balanced mind. He was, I take it, the most perfect reasoning and observing machine that the world has seen, but as a lover he would have placed himself in a false position. He never spoke of the softer passions, save with a jibe and a sneer. They were admirable things for the observer, excellent for drawing the veil from men's motives and actions. But for the trained reasoner to admit such intrusions into his own delicate and finely adjusted temperament was to introduce a distracting factor which might throw a doubt upon all his mental results. Grit in a sensitive instrument, or a crack in one of his own high-power lenses, would not be more disturbing than a strong emotion in a nature such as his. And yet there was but one woman to him, and that woman was the late Irene Adler, of dubious and questionable memory. I had seen little of Holmes lately, my marriage had drifted us away from each other. My own complete happiness, and the home-centered interests which rise up around the man who first finds himself master of his own establishment, were sufficient to absorb all my attention, while Holmes, who loathed every form of society with his whole bohemian soul, remained in our lodgings in Baker Street, buried among his old books, and alternating from week to week between cocaine and ambition. The drowsiness of the drug and the fierce energy of his own keen nature. He was still, as ever, deeply attracted by the study of crime, and occupied his immense faculties and extraordinary powers of observation in following out those clues, in clearing up those mysteries which had been abandoned as hopeless by the official police. From time to time I heard some vague account of his doings, of his summons to Odessa in the case of the Tripoff murder, of his clearing up of the singular tragedy of the Atkinson brothers at Trincomalee, and finally of the mission 
which she had accomplished so delicately and successfully for the reigning family of Holland. Beyond these signs of his activity, however, which I merely shared with all the readers of the daily press, I knew little of my former friend and companion. One night, it was on the 20th of March, 1888, I was returning from a journey to a patient, for I had now returned to civil practice, when my way led me through Baker Street. As I passed the well-remembered door, which must always be associated in my mind with my wooing, and with the dark incidents of the study in Scarlet, I was seized with a keen desire to see Holmes again, and to know how he was employing his extraordinary powers. His rooms were brilliantly lit, and, even as I looked up, I saw his tall, spare figure pass twice in a dark silhouette against the blind. He was pacing the room swiftly, eagerly, with his head sunk upon his chest and his hands clasped behind him. To me, who knew his every mood and habit, his attitude and manner told their own story. He was at work again. He had risen out of his drug-created dreams and was hot upon the scent of some new problem. I rang the bell and was shown up to the chamber which had formerly been in part my own. His manner was not effusive. It seldom was, but he was glad, I think, to see me. With hardly a word spoken, but with a kindly eye, he waved me to an armchair, threw across a case of cigars, and indicated a spirit case and a gasogene in the corner. Then he stood before the fire and looked me over in his singular introspective fashion. "'What luck suits you?' he remarked. "'I think, Watson, that you have put on seven and a half pounds since I saw you.' Seven, I answered. "'Indeed. I should have thought a little more, just a trifle more, I fancy. Watson, and in practice again, I observe, you did not tell me that you intended to go into harness. Then how do you know? I see it. I deduce it. How do I know that you have been getting yourself very wet lately, and that you have a most clumsy and careless servant-girl?' "'My dear Holmes,' said I, "'this is too much. You would certainly have been burned had you lived a few centuries ago. It is true that I had a country walk on Thursday, and came home in a dreadful mess, but as I have changed my clothes I can't imagine how you deduce it. As to Mary Jane, she is incorrigible, and my wife has given her notice. But there, again, I fail to see how you work it out.' He chuckled to himself and rubbed his long, nervous hands together. Huh, it is simplicity itself, said he. My eyes tell me that on the inside of your left shoe, just where the firefight strikes it, the leather is scored by six almost parallel cuts. Obviously, they have been caused by someone who has very carelessly scraped round the edges of the sole in order to remove crusted mud from it. Hence, you see, my double deduction that you had been out in vile weather, and that you had a particularly malignant boot-slitting specimen of the London slavey. As to your practice, if a gentleman walks into my room, smelling of iodoform, with a black mark of nitrate of silver upon his right forefinger and a bulge on the right side of his top hat to show where he has secreted his stethoscope, I must be dull indeed if I do not pronounce him to be an active member of the medical profession. I could not help laughing at the ease with which he explained his process of deduction. When I hear you give your reasons, I remarked, the thing always appears to me to be so ridiculously simple that I could easily do it myself, though at each successive instance of your reasoning I am baffled until you explain your process. And yet I believe that my eyes are as good as yours. Quite so, he answered, lighting a cigarette, and throwing himself down into an armchair. You see, but you do not observe. The distinction is clear. For example, you have frequently seen the steps which lead up from the hall to this room. Frequently. 
How often? Well, some hundreds of times. Then how many are there? How many? I don't know. Quite so. You have not observed, and yet you have seen. That is just my point. Now, I know that there are seventeen steps, because I have both seen and observed. By the way, since you are interested in these little problems, and since you are good enough to chronicle one or two of my trifling experiences, you may be interested in this. He threw over a sheet of thick, pink-tinted note-paper, which had been lying open upon the table. It came by the last post, said he. Read it aloud. The note was undated, and without either signature or address. There will call upon you tonight, at a quarter to eight o'clock, it said. A gentleman who desires to consult you upon a matter of the very deepest moment. Your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe have shown that you are one who may safely be trusted with matters which are of an importance which can hardly be exaggerated. This account of you we have from all quarters received. Be in your chamber then at that hour, and do not take it amiss if your visitor wear a mask. This is indeed a mystery, I remarked. What do you imagine that means? I have no data yet. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. But the note itself, what do you deduce from it? I carefully examined the writing and the paper upon it, which it was written. The man who wrote it was presumably well-to-do, I remarked, endeavoring to imitate my companion's processes. Such paper could not be bought under half a crown a packet. It is peculiarly strong and stiff. Peculiar? That is the very word, said Holmes. It is not an English paper at all. Hold it up to the light. I did so, and saw a large E with a small G, a capital P, and a large capital G with a small T woven into the texture of the paper. What do you make of that? asked Holmes. The name of the maker, no doubt, or his monogram, rather. Not at all. The G with a small T stands for Gesellschaft which is the German for company. It is a customary contraction like our co. P, of course, stands for papier. Now for the E, G. Let us glance at our continental gazetteer. He took down a heavy brown volume from his shelves. Iglo, Iglonitz, here we are, Egria. It is in a German-speaking country in Bohemia, not far from Carlsbad, remarkable as being the scene of the death of Wallenstein, and for its numerous glass factories and paper mills. Ha ha, my boy, what do you make of that? His eyes sparkled, and he sent up a great blue triumphant cloud from his cigarette. The paper was made in Bohemia, I said. Precisely, and the man who wrote the note is a German. Do you know the peculiar construction of the sentence? This account of you we have from all quarters received. A Frenchman or Russian could not have written that. It is the German who is so uncourteous to his verbs. It only remains, therefore, to discover what is wanted by this German who writes upon bohemian paper and prefers wearing a mask to showing his face. And here he comes, if I am not mistaken, to resolve all our doubts. As he spoke, there was the sharp sound of horses' hoofs and grating wheels against the curb, followed by a sharp pull at the bell. Holmes whistled. A pair by the sound, said he. Yes, he continued, glancing out of the window. A nice little brougham and a pair of beauties, a hundred and fifty guineas apiece. There's money in this case, Watson, if there is nothing else. I think that I had better go, Holmes. 
Not a bit, doctor. Stay where you are. I am lost without my Boswell. And this promises to be interesting. It would be a pity to miss it. But your client... Never mind him. I may want your help, and so may he. Here he comes. Sit down in that armchair, doctor, and give us your best attention. A slow and heavy step which had been heard upon the stairs and in the passage, paused immediately outside the door. Then there was a loud and authoritative tap. "'Come in,' said Holmes. A man entered, who could hardly have been less than six feet six inches in height, with the chest and limbs of a Hercules. His dress was rich with a richness which would, in England, be looked upon as akin to bad taste. Heavy bands of astrakhan were slashed across the sleeves and fronts of his double-breasted coat, while the deep blue cloak, which was thrown over his shoulders, was lined with flame-colored silk and secured at the neck with a brooch, which consisted of a single flaming barrel. Boots, which extended halfway up his calves, and which were trimmed at the tops with rich brown fur, completed the impression of barbaric opulence, which was suggested by his whole appearance. He carried a broad-brimmed hat in his hand, while he wore across the upper part of his face, extending down past the cheekbones, a black vizard mask, which he had apparently adjusted that very moment, for his hand was still raised to it as he entered. From the lower part of his face he appeared to be a man of strong character, with a thick hanging lip, and a long, straight chin, suggested of resolution, pushed to the length of obstinacy. "'You have my note?' he asked with a deep, harsh voice and a strongly marked German accent. "'I told you that I would call.' He looked from one to the other of us, as if uncertain which to address. "'Pray take a seat,' said Holmes. "'This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson, who is occasionally good enough to help me in my cases.' Whom have I the honor to address? You may address me as the Count von Kram, a bohemian nobleman. I understand that this gentleman, your friend, is a man of honor and discretion, whom I may trust with a matter of the most extreme importance. If not, I should much prefer to communicate with you alone. I rose to go but Holmes caught me by the wrist and pushed me back into my chair. "'It is both or none,' said he. "'You may say before this gentleman anything which you may say to me.' The Count shrugged his broad shoulders. "'Then I must begin,' said he, "'by binding you both to absolute secrecy for two years. At the end of that time the matter will be of no importance. At present it is not too much to say that it is of such weight it may have an influence upon european history i promise said holmes and i you will excuse this mask continued our strange visitor the august person who employs me wishes his agent to be unknown to you and i may confess at once that the title by which i have just called myself is not exactly my own I was aware of it, said Holmes dryly. The circumstances are of great delicacy, and every precaution has to be taken to quench what might grow in to be an immense scandal, and seriously compromise one of the reigning families of Europe. To speak plainly, the matter implicates the great house of Ormstein, hereditary kings of Bohemia. I was also aware of that, murmured Holmes, settling himself down in his armchair and closing his eyes. Our visitor glanced with some apparent surprise at the languid, lounging figure of the man who had been no doubt depicted to him as the most incisive reasoner and most energetic agent in Europe. Holmes slowly reopened his eyes and looked impatiently at his gigantic client. If your majesty would condescend to state your case, he remarked, I should be better able to advise you. 
The man sprang from his chair and paced up and down the room in uncontrollable agitation. Then, with a gesture of desperation, he tore the mask from his face and hurled it upon the ground. "'You are right!' he cried. "'I am the king. Why should I attempt to conceal it?' "'Why, indeed?' murmured Holmes. "'Your majesty had not spoken before I was aware that I was addressing Wilhelm Gottsreich Sigismund von Ormstein, Grand Duke of Castle Felstein, and hereditary king of Bohemia.' "'But you can understand,' said our strange visitor, sitting down once more and passing his hand over his high white forehead. You can understand that I am not accustomed to doing such business in my own person. Yet the matter was so delicate that I could not confide it to an agent without putting myself in his power. I have come incognito from Prague for the purpose of consulting you. Then pray consult, said Holmes, shutting his eyes once more. The facts are briefly these. Some years ago, during a lengthy visit to Warsaw, I made the acquaintance of the well-known adventuress, Irene Adler. The name is no doubt familiar to you. Kindly look her up in my index, doctor, murmured Holmes, without opening his eyes. For many years he had adopted a system of docketing all paragraphs concerning men and things, so that it was difficult to name a subject or a person on which he could not at once furnish information. In this case, I found her biography sandwiched in between that of a Hebrew rabbi and that of a staff commander who had written a monograph upon the deep-sea fishes. Let me see, said Holmes. Hmm. Born in New Jersey in the year 1858. Contralto. La Scala, hm. Prima Donna Imperial Opera of Warsaw, yes. Retired from operatic stage, ha. Living in London, quite so. Your Majesty, as I understand, became entangled with this young person, wrote her some compromising letters, and is now desirous of getting those letters back. Precisely so. But how? Was there a secret marriage? None. No legal papers or certificates? None. Then I fail to follow your majesty. If this young person should produce her letters for blackmailing or other purposes, how is she to prove their authenticity? There is the writing. Pooh, pooh, forgery. My private notepaper. Stolen. My own seal imitated my photograph bought we've uh, bought in the photograph oh dear that is very bad your majesty has indeed committed an indiscretion i was mad insane you have compromised yourself seriously i was only crown prince then i was young i am but thirty now it must be recovered. We have tried and failed. Your Majesty must pay. It must be bought. She will not sell. Stolen, then? Five attempts have been made. Twice burglars in my pay ransacked her house. Once we diverted her luggage when she travelled. Twice she has been waylaid. There has been no result. No sign of it? absolutely none holmes laughed <laughs> it is quite a pretty little problem said he but a very serious one to me returned the king reproachfully very indeed and what does she propose to do with the photograph to ruin me but how i am about to be married so i have heard to Clotilde Lotman von Saxe Meningen, second daughter of the King of Scandinavia. You may know the strict principles of her family. She is herself the very soul of delicacy. A shadow of a doubt as to my conduct would bring the matter to an end. And Irene Adler? 
threatens to send them the photograph. And she will do it. I know that she will do it. You do not know her, but she has a soul of steel. She has the face of the most beautiful of women, and the mind of the most resolute of men. Rather than I should marry another woman, there are no lengths to which she would not go. None. You are sure that she has not sent it yet? I am sure. And why? Because she has said that she would send it on the day when the betrothal was publicly proclaimed. That will be next Monday. Oh, then we have three days yet, said Holmes with a yawn. That is very fortunate, as I have one or two matters of importance to look into just at present your majesty will of course stay in london for the present certainly you will find me at the langham under the name of the count von kram then i shall drop you a line to let you know how we progress pray do so i shall be all anxiety then as to money you have carte blanche absolutely I tell you that I would give one of the provinces of my kingdom to have that photograph. And for present expenses? The king took a heavy chamois leather bag from under his cloak and laid it on the table. There are three hundred pounds in gold and seven hundred in notes, he said. Holmes scribbled a receipt upon a sheet of his notebook and handed it to him. And mademoiselle's address? he asked. Is Bryony Lodge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. Holmes took a note of it. One other question, said he. Was the photograph a cabinet? It was. Then good night, your majesty, and I trust that we shall soon have some good news for you. And good night, Watson, he added, as the wheels of the royal brougham rolled down the street. If you will be good enough to call tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock, I should like to chat this little matter over with you. Part Two At three o'clock precisely, I was at Baker Street, but Holmes had not yet returned. The landlady informed me that he had left the house shortly after eight o'clock in the morning. I sat down beside the fire, however, with the intention of awaiting him, however long he might be. I was already deeply interested in his inquiry, for, though it was surrounded by none of the grim and strange features which were associated with the two crimes which I have already recorded, still, the nature of the case and the exalted station of his client gave it a character of its own. Indeed, apart from the nature of the investigation which my friend had on hand, there was something in his masterly grasp of a situation, and his keen, incisive reasoning, which made it a pleasure to me to study his system of work, and to follow the quick, subtle methods by which he disentangled the most inextricable mysteries. So accustomed was I to his invariable success that the very possibility of his failing had ceased to enter my head. It was close upon four before the door opened, and a drunken-looking groom, ill-kempt and side-whiskered, with an inflamed face and disreputable clothes, walked into the room. Accustomed as I was to my friend's amazing powers in the use of disguises, I had to look three times before I was certain that it was indeed he. With a nod, he vanished into the bedroom, whence he emerged in five minutes, tweed-suited and respectable, as of old. Putting his hands into his pockets, he stretched out his legs in front of the fire and laughed heartily for some minutes. "'Well, really!' he cried, and then he choked and laughed again, until he was obliged to lie back, limp and helpless, in the chair. "'What is it?' "'It's quite too funny.' I am sure you could never guess how I employed my morning, or what I ended by doing. I can't imagine. I suppose that you have been watching the habits 
and perhaps the house of Miss Irene Adler? Quite so, but the sequel was rather unusual. I will tell you, however, I left the house a little after eight o'clock this morning, in the character of a groom out of work. There is a wonderful sympathy and freemasonry among horsey men. Be one of them, and you will know all that there is to know. I soon found Bryony Lodge. It is a bijou villa, with a garden at the back, but built out in front right up to the road, two stories, chublock to the door, large sitting room on the right side, well furnished, with long windows almost to the floor, and those preposterous English window fasteners which a child could open. Behind there was nothing remarkable, save that the passage window could be reached from the top of the coach house. I walked round it and examined it closely from every point of view, but without noting anything else of interest. I then lounged down the street and found, as I expected, that there was a mews in a lane which runs down by one wall of the garden. I lent the ostlers a hand in rubbing down their horses, and received in exchange twopence, a glass of half and half, two fills of shag tobacco, and as much information as I could desire about Miss Adler, to say nothing of half a dozen other people in the neighborhood, in whom I was not in the least interested but whose biographies I was compelled to listen to. "'And what of Irene Adler?' I asked. "'Oh, she has turned all the men's heads down in that part. She is the daintiest thing under a bonnet on this planet. So say the serpentine muse to a man. She lives quietly, sings at concerts, drives out at five every day, and returns at seven sharp for dinner.' seldom goes out at other times except when she sings has only one male visitor but a good deal of him he is dark handsome and dashing never calls less than once a day and often twice he is a mr godfrey norton of the inner temple see the advantages of a cabman as a confidant they had driven him home a dozen times from serpentine mews and knew all about him. When I had listened to all they had to tell, I began to walk up and down near Bryony Lodge once more, and to think over my plan of campaign. This Godfrey Norton was evidently an important factor in the matter. He was a lawyer. That sounded ominous. What was the relation between them, and what the object of his repeated visits? Was she his client? his friend, or his mistress. If the former, she had probably transferred the photograph to his keeping. If the latter, it was less likely. On the issue of this question depended whether I should continue my work at Bryony Lodge, or turn my attention to the gentleman's chambers in the temple. It was a delicate point, and it widened the field of my inquiry. I fear that I bore you with these details, but I have to let you see my little difficulties, if you are to understand the situation. I am following you closely, I answered. I was still balancing the matter in my mind when a handsome cab drove up to Bryony Lodge, and a gentleman sprang out. He was a remarkably handsome man, dark, aquiline, and moustached evidently the man of whom i had heard he appeared to be in a great hurry shouted to the cabman to wait and brushed past the maid who opened the door with the air of a man who was thoroughly at home he was in the house about half an hour and i could catch glimpses of him in the windows of the sitting-room pacing up and down talking excitedly and waving his arms of her i could see nothing presently he emerged looking even more flurried than before. As he stepped up to the cab, he pulled a gold watch from his pocket and looked at it earnestly. "'Drive like the devil!' he shouted, first to Gross and Hankey's in Regent Street, and then to the church of St. Monica in the Edgware Road. Half a guinea, if you do it in twenty minutes!' 
away they went, and I was just wondering whether I should not do well to follow them when up the lane came a neat little landau, the coachman with his coat only half buttoned, and his tie under his ear, while all the tags of his harness were sticking out of the buckles. It hadn't pulled up before she shot out of the hall door and into it. I only caught a glimpse of her at the moment, but she was a lovely woman, with a face that a man might die for. "'The Church of St. Monica, John!' she cried, and half a sovereign if you reach it in twenty minutes. This was quite too good to lose, Watson. I was just balancing whether I should run for it or whether I should perch behind her landau when a cab came through the street. The driver looked twice at such a shabby fare, but I jumped in before he could object. The Church of St. Monica, said I, and half a sovereign, if you reach it in twenty minutes. It was twenty-five minutes to twelve, and of course it was clear enough what was in the wind. My cabby drove fast. I don't think I ever drove faster, but the others were there before us. The cab and the landau, with their steaming horses, were in front of the door when I arrived. I paid the man and hurried into the church. There was not a soul there save the two whom I had followed and a surplus clergyman, who seemed to be expostulating with them. They were all three standing in a knot in front of the altar. I lounged up the side aisle like any other idler who has dropped into a church. Suddenly, to my surprise, the three at the altar faced round to me, and Godfrey Norton came running as hard as he could towards me. "'Thank God!' he cried. "'You'll do. Come! Come!' "'What, then?' I asked. "'Come, man! Come! Only three minutes, or it won't be legal!' I was half-dragged up to the altar, and before I knew where I was I found myself mumbling responses which were whispered in my ear and vouching for things of which I knew nothing, and generally assisting in the secure tying up of Irene Adler, spinster, to Godfrey Norton, bachelor. It was all done in an instant, and there was the gentleman thanking me on the one side and the lady on the other, while the clergyman beamed on me in front. It was the most preposterous position in which I ever found myself in my life, and it was the thought of it that started me laughing just now. It seems that there had been some informality about their license, that the clergyman absolutely refused to marry them without a witness of some sort, and that my lucky appearance saved the bridegroom from having to sally out into the streets in search of a best man. The bride gave me a sovereign, and I mean to wear it on my watch-chain in memory of the occasion." "'This is a very unexpected turn of affairs,' said I. "'And what then?' "'Well, I found my plans very seriously menaced. It looked as if the pair might take an immediate departure, and so necessitate very prompt and energetic measures on my part. At the church door, however, they separated, he driving back to the temple, and she to her own house. "'I shall drive out in the park at five, as usual, she said as she left him. I heard no more. They drove away in different directions, and I went off to make my own arrangements. Which are? Some cold beef and a glass of beer, he answered, ringing the bell. I have been too busy to think of food, and I am likely to be busier still this evening. By the way, doctor, I shall want your cooperation. I shall be delighted. You don't mind breaking the law? Not in the least. Nor running a chance of arrest? Not in a good cause. Oh, the cause is excellent. Then I am your man. I was sure that I might rely on you. But what is it you wish? When Mrs. Turner has brought in the tray, I will make it clear to you. Now, he said, as he turned hungrily, on the simple fare that our landlady had provided. I must discuss it while I eat, for I have not much time. It is nearly five now. In two hours we must be on the scene of action. 
Miss Irene, or Madam, rather, returns from her drive at seven. We must be at Bryony Lodge to meet her. And what then? You must leave that to me. I have already arranged what is to occur. There is only one point on which I must insist. You must not interfere. Come what may. You understand? I am to be neutral? To do nothing, whatever. There will probably be some small unpleasantness. Do not join in it. It will end in my being conveyed into the house. Four or five minutes afterwards, the sitting room window will open. You are to station yourself close to that open window. Yes. You are to watch me, for I will be visible to you. Yes. And when I raise my hand, so, you will throw into the room what I give you to throw, and will, at the same time, raise the cry of fire. You quite follow me? Entirely. It is nothing very formidable, he said, taking a long cigar-shaped roll from his pocket. It is an ordinary plumber's smoke rocket, fitted with a cap at either end to make it self-lighting. Your task is confined to that. When you raise your cry of fire, it will be taken up by quite a number of people. You may then walk to the end of the street, and I will rejoin you in ten minutes. I hope that I have made myself clear. I am to remain neutral, to get near the window, to watch you, and at the signal, to throw in this object, then to raise the cry of fire and to wait you at the corner of the street. Precisely. Then you may entirely rely on me. That is excellent. I think, perhaps, it is almost time that I prepare for the new role I have to play. He disappeared into his bedroom and returned in a few minutes, in the character of an amiable and simple-minded nonconformist clergyman. His broad black hat, his baggy trousers, his white tie, his sympathetic smile and general look of peering and benevolent curiosity were such as Mr. John Hare alone could have equaled. It was not merely that Holmes changed his costume. His expression, his manner, his very soul seemed to vary with every fresh part that he assumed. The stage lost a fine actor, even as science lost an acute reasoner when he became a specialist in crime. It was a quarter past six when we left Baker Street, and it still wanted ten minutes to the hour when we found ourselves in Serpentine Avenue. It was already dusk, and the lamps were just being lighted as we paced up and down in front of Bryony Lodge, waiting for the coming of its occupant. The house was just such as I had pictured it from Sherlock Holmes' succinct description but the locality appeared to be less private than I expected. On the contrary, for a small street in a quiet neighborhood, it was remarkably animated. There was a group of shabbily dressed men smoking and laughing in a corner, a scissors grinder with his wheel, two guardsmen who were flirting with a nurse girl, and several well-dressed young men who were lounging up and down with cigars in their mouths. You see remarked Holmes, as we paced to and fro in front of the house. This marriage rather simplifies matters. The photograph becomes a double-edged weapon now. The chances are that she would be as averse to its being seen by Mr. Godfrey Norton as our client is to its coming to the eyes of his princess. Now the question is, where are we to find the photograph? Where, indeed? It is most unlikely that she carries it about with her. It is cabinet size, too large for easy concealment about a woman's dress. She knows that the king is capable of having her waylaid and searched. Two attempts of the sort have already been made. We may take it, then, that she does not carry it about with her. Where, then? Her banker or her lawyer. There is that double possibility. But I am inclined to think neither. Women are naturally secretive, and they like to do their own secreting. Why should she hand it over to anyone else? 
she could trust her own guardianship, but she could not tell what indirect or political influence might be brought to bear upon a businessman. Besides, remember that she had resolved to use it within a few days. It must be where she can lay her hands upon it. It must be in her own house. But it has twice been burgled. Psha! They did not know how to look. But how will you look? I will not look. What then? I will get her to show me. But she will refuse. She will not be able to. But I hear the rumble of wheels. It is her carriage. Now carry out my orders to the letter. As he spoke, the gleam of the side-lights of a carriage came round the curve of the avenue. It was a smart little landau which rattled up to the door of Bryony Lodge. As it pulled up, one of the loafing men on the corner dashed forward to open the door in the hope of earning a copper, but was elbowed away by another loafer who had rushed up with the same intention. A fierce quarrel broke out, which was increased by the two guardsmen, who took sides with one of the loungers, and by the scissors grinder, who was equally hot upon the other side. A blow was struck, and in an instant the lady, who had stepped from her carriage, was the centre of a little knot of flushed and struggling men, who struck savagely at each other with their fists and sticks. Holmes dashed into the crowd to protect the lady, but just as he reached her, he gave a cry and dropped to the ground, with the blood running freely down his face. At his fall, the guardsmen took to their heels in one direction and the loungers in the other, while a number of better-dressed people, who had watched the scuffle without taking part in it, crowded in to help the lady and to attend to the injured man. Irene Adler, as I will still call her, had hurried up the steps, but she stood at the top with her superb figure outlined against the lights of the hall, looking back into the street. "'Is the poor gentleman much hurt?' she asked. "'He is dead!' cried several voices. "'No, no, there's life in him!' shouted another. "'But he'll be gone before you can get him to hospital.' "'He's a brave fellow,' said a woman. "'They would have had the lady's purse and watch if it hadn't been for him. "'They were a gang, and a rough one, too. "'Ah, he's breathing now.' "'He can't lie in the street. "'May we bring him in, marm? "'Surely. "'Bring him into the sitting-room. "'There is a comfortable sofa. "'This way, please.' "'Slowly and solemnly he was borne into Bryony Lodge "'and laid out in the principal room.' while I still observed the proceedings from my post by the window. The lamps had been lit, but the blinds had not been drawn, so that I could see Holmes as he lay upon the couch. I do not know whether he was seized with compunction at that moment, for the part he was playing, but I know that I never felt more heartily ashamed of myself in my life than when I saw the beautiful creature against whom I was conspiring, or the grace and kindliness with which she waited upon the injured man. And yet it would be the blackest treachery to Holmes to draw back now from the part which he had entrusted to me. I hardened my heart and took the smoke rocket from under my ulster. After all, I thought, we are not injuring her. We are but preventing her from injuring another. Holmes, had sat up upon the couch, and I saw him motion like a man who was in need of air. A maid rushed across and threw open the window. At the same instant I saw him raise his hand, and at the signal I tossed my rocket into the room with a cry of fire. The word was no sooner out of my mouth than the whole crowd of spectators, well-dressed and ill, gentlemen, ostlers, and servant-maids, joined in a general shriek of fire. Thick clouds of smoke curled through the room and out at the open window. I caught a glimpse of rushing figures, and a moment later the voice of Holmes from within, assuring them that it was a false alarm. 
Slipping through the shouting crowd, I made my way to the corner of the street, and in ten minutes was rejoiced to find my friend's arm in mine, and to get away from the scene of uproar. He walked swiftly and in silence for some few minutes until we had turned down one of the quiet streets which led towards the Edgware Road. "'You did it very nicely, doctor,' he remarked. "'Nothing could have been better. It is all right.' You have the photograph? I know where it is. And how did you find out? She showed me, as I told you she would. I am still in the dark. I do not wish to make a mystery, said he, laughing. The matter was perfectly simple. You, of course, saw that everyone in the street was an accomplice. They were all engaged for the evening. I guessed as much. Then, when the row broke out, I had a little moist red paint in the palm of my hand. I rushed forward, fell down, clapped my hand to my face, and became a piteous spectacle. It is an old trick. That also I could fathom. Then they carried me in. She was bound to have me in. What else could she do? And into her sitting room, which was the very room which I suspected. It lay between that and her bedroom, and I was determined to see which. They laid me on a couch. I motioned for air. They were compelled to open the window, and you had your chance. How did that help you? It was all important. When a woman thinks that her house is on fire, her instinct is at once to rush to the thing which she values most. It is a perfectly overpowering impulse and I have more than once taken advantage of it. In the case of the Darlington substitution scandal, it was of use to me, and also in the Arnsworth Castle business. A married woman grabs at her baby, an unmarried one reaches for her jewel box. Now it was clear to me that Our Lady of today had nothing in the house more precious to her than what we are in quest of. She would rush to secure it, the alarm of fire was admirably done. The smoke and shouting were enough to shake nerves of steel. She responded beautifully. The photograph is in a recess behind a sliding panel just above the right bell pole. She was there in an instant, and I caught a glimpse of it as she half drew it out. When I cried out that it was a false alarm, she replaced it, glanced at the rocket, rushed from the room, and I have not seen her since. I rose, and, making my excuses, escaped from the house. I hesitated whether to attempt to secure the photograph at once, but the coachman had come in, and, as he was watching me narrowly, it seemed safer to wait. A little over-precipitance may ruin all. "'And now?' I asked. "'Our quest is practically finished.' I shall call with the king tomorrow, and with you, if you care to come with us. We will be shown into the sitting-room to wait for the lady, but it is probable that when she comes she may find neither of us nor the photograph. It might be a satisfaction to his majesty to regain it with his own hands. And when will you call? At eight in the morning. She will not be up so that we shall have a clear field. Besides, we must be prompt, for this marriage may mean a complete change in her life and habits. I must wire to the king without delay. We had reached Baker Street, and had stopped at the door. He was searching his pockets for the key, when someone passing said, Good night, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. There were several people on the pavement at the time, but the greeting appeared to come from a slim youth in an ulster who had hurried by. "'I've heard that voice before,' said Holmes, staring down the dimly lit street. "'Now I wonder who the deuce that could have been.'" Part 3 I slept at Baker Street that night, and we were engaged upon our toast and coffee in the morning when the King of Bohemia rushed into the room. "'You have really got it?' he cried, 
grasping Sherlock Holmes by either shoulder and looking eagerly into his face. Not yet. But you have hopes? I have hopes. Then come, I am all impatience to be gone. We must have a cab. No, my brougham is waiting. Then that will simplify matters. We descended and started off once more for Bryony Lodge. Irene Adler is married, remarked Holmes. Married? When? Yesterday. But to whom? To an English lawyer named Norton. But she could not love him. I am in hopes that she does. And why in hopes? Because it would spare your majesty all fear of future annoyance. If the lady loves her husband, she does not love your majesty. If she does not love your majesty, there is no reason why she should interfere with your majesty's plan. It is true. And yet, well, I wish she had been of my own station. What a queen she would have made. He relapsed into a moody silence, which was not broken until we drew up in Serpentine Avenue. The door of Bryony Lodge was open, and an elderly woman stood upon the steps. She watched us with a sardonic eye as we stepped from the brawl. "'Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I believe,' said she. "'I am Mr. Holmes.' answered my companion, looking at her with a questioning and rather startled gaze. Indeed, my mistress told me that you were likely to call. She left this morning with her husband by the 515 train from Charing Cross for the continent. What? Sherlock Holmes staggered back, white with chagrin and surprise. Do you mean that she has left England? Never to return. And the papers? asked the king hoarsely. All is lost. We shall see. He pushed past the servant and rushed into the drawing room, followed by the king and myself. The furniture was scattered about in every direction, with dismantled shelves and open drawers, as if the lady had hurriedly ransacked them before her flight. Holmes rushed at the bell pull, tore back a small sliding shutter, and, plunging in his hand, pulled out a photograph and a letter. The photograph was of Irene Adler herself in evening dress. The letter was superscribed to Sherlock Holmes, Esquire, to be left till called for. My friend tore it open, and we all three read it together. It was dated at midnight of the preceding night, and ran in this way. My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, you really did it very well. You took me in completely. Until after the alarm of fire, I had not a suspicion. But then, when I found how I had betrayed myself, I began to think. I had been warned against you months ago. I had been told that if the king employed an agent, it would certainly be you. And your address had been given me. Yet, with all this, you made me reveal what you wanted to know. Even after I became suspicious, I found it hard to think evil of such a dear, kind old clergyman. But, you know, I have been trained as an actress myself. Male costume is nothing new to me. I often take advantage of the freedom which it gives. I sent John, the coachman, to watch you, ran upstairs, got into my walking clothes, as I call them, and came down just as you departed. Well, I followed you to your door, and so made sure that I was really an object of interest to the celebrated Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Then I rather imprudently wished you good night and started for the temple to see my husband. We both thought the best resource was flight, when pursued by so formidable an antagonist, so you will find the nest empty when you call tomorrow. As to the photograph, your client may rest in peace. I love and am loved by a better man than he. The king may do what he will without hindrance from one whom he has cruelly wronged. I keep it only to safeguard myself and to preserve a weapon which will always secure me from any steps which he might take in the future. 
I leave a photograph which he might care to possess, and I remain, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, very truly yours, Irene Norton, nay Adler. What a woman! Oh, what a woman! cried the King of Bohemia, when we had all three read this epistle. Did I not tell you how quick and resolute she was? Would she not have made an admirable queen? Is it not a pity that she was not on my level? From what I have seen of the lady, she seems indeed to be on a very different level to your majesty, said Holmes coldly. I am sorry that I have not been able to bring your majesty's business to a more successful conclusion. On the contrary, my dear sir, cried the king, nothing could be more successful. I know that her word is inviolate. The photograph is now as safe as if it were in the fire. I am glad to hear your majesty say so. I am immensely indebted to you. Pray tell me in what way I can reward you. This ring. He slipped an emerald snake ring from his finger and held it out upon the palm of his hand. Your majesty has something which I should value even more highly, said Holmes. You have but to name it. This photograph. The king stared at him in amazement. Irene's photograph? he cried. Certainly, if you wish it. I thank your majesty. Then there is no more to be done in the matter. I have the honor to wish you a very good morning. He bowed, and, turning away without observing the hand which the king had stretched out to him, he set off in my company for his chambers. And that was how a great scandal threatened to affect the kingdom of Bohemia, and how the best plans of Mr. Sherlock Holmes were beaten by a woman's wit. He used to make merry over the cleverness of women, but I have not heard him do it of late. And when he speaks of Irene Adler, or when he refers to her photograph, it is always under the honorable title of the woman. End of Part 3 End of Section 2 A Scandal in Bohemia by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Section 3 of 1891 Collection A Native of Wemby by Sarah Orrin Jewett for the 1891 Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. 1891 Collection by Various. Section 3. A Native of Wenby by Sarah Oren Jewett. Part 1. On the teacher's desk in the little roadside schoolhouse, there was a bunch of mayflowers beside a dented and bent brass bell a small Worcester's dictionary without any cover, and a worn Morocco-covered Bible. These were placed in an orderly row, and behind them was a small wooden box which held some broken pieces of blackboard crayon. The teacher, whom no timid new scholar could look at boldly, wore her accustomed air of authority and importance. She might have been nineteen years old, not more, but for the time being she scorned the frivolities of youth. The hot May sun was shining in at the smoky, small-paned windows. Sometimes an outside shutter swung to with a creak and eclipsed the glare. The narrow door stood wide open to the left as you faced the desk, and an old spotted dog lay asleep on the step and looked wise and old enough to have gone to school with several generations of children. It was half-past three o'clock in the afternoon, and the primer class, settled into the apathy of after-recess fatigue, presented a straggling front as they stood listlessly on the floor. As for the big boys and girls, they also were longing to be at liberty. But the pretty teacher, Miss Marilla Hender, seemed quite as energetic as when school was begun in the morning. The spring breeze blew in 
at the open door, and even fluttered the primer leaves, but the back of the room felt hot close, as if it were midsummer. The children in the class read their lessons in those high-keyed, groaning voices, which older teachers learn to associate with faint powers of perception. Only one or two of them had an awakened human look in their eyes, such as Matthew Arnold delighted himself in finding so often in the school children of France. Most of these poor little students were as inadequate at that very moment to the pursuit of letters as if they had been woolly spring lambs on a sunny hillside. The teacher corrected and admonished with great patience, glancing now and then toward points of danger and insurrection, whence came a suspicious buzz of whispering from behind a desk lid or a pair of widespread large geographies. Now and then a tolling child would rise and come down the aisle, with his forefinger firm upon a puzzling word, as if it were an unclassified insect. It was a lovely, beckoning day out of doors. The children felt like captives. There was something that provoked rebellion in the droning voices, the buzzing of an early wild bee against the sunlit pane, and even in the stuffy familiar odor of the place, the odor of apples and crumbs of doughnuts and gingerbread in the dinner pails on the high entry nails, and of all the little gowns and trousers that had brushed through junipers and young pines on their way to school. The bee left his prisoning pain at last and came over to the mayflowers, which were in full bloom, although the season was very late, and deep in the woods there were still some grey-backed snowdrifts, speckled with bits of bark and moss from the trees above. "'Come, come, Ezra,' urged the young teacher, rapping her desk sharply. "'Stop watching that common bee. You know well enough what those letters spell. You won't learn to read at this rate until you are a grown man.' Mind your book now. You ought to remember who went to this school when he was a little boy. You've heard folks tell about the Honorable Joseph K. Laneway? He used to be in Primer, just as you are now. And twasn't long before he was out of it, either, and was called the smartest boy in school. He's got to be a general and a senator and one of the richest men out west. You don't seem to have the least might of ambition today, any of you. The exhortation, entirely personal in the beginning, had swiftly passed to a general rebuke. Ezra looked relieved, and the other children brightened up as they recognized a tale familiar to their ears. Anything was better than trying to study in that dull last hour of afternoon school. Yes continued Miss Hender, pleased that she had at last roused something like proper attention. You all ought to be proud that you are schoolmates of District Number 4, and can remember that the celebrated General Laneway had the same early advantages as you, and think what he has made of himself by perseverance and ambition. The pupils were familiar enough with the illustrious history of their noble predecessor. They were sure to be told, in lawless moments, that if Mr. Laneway were to come in and see them, he would be mortified to death. And the members of the school committee always referred to him and said that he had been a poor boy and was now a self-made man. As if every man were not self-made as to his character and reputation. At this point, young Johnny Spencer showed his next neighbor, in the back of his Colburn's arithmetic, an imaginary portrait of their district hero, which caused them both to chuckle derisively. The Honorable Mr. Laneway figured on the flyleaf as an extremely cross-eyed person, with strangely crooked legs and arms and a terrific expression. He was outlined with red and blue pencils as to coat and trousers, 
and held a reddened scalp in one hand and a blue tomahawk in the other being closely associated in the artist's mind with the early settlements of the far west there was a noise of wheels in the road nearby and though miss hender had much more to say everybody ceased to listen to her and turned toward the windows leaning far forward over their desks to see who might be passing they caught a glimpse of a shiny carriage the old dog bounded out barking but nothing passed the open door the carriage had stopped someone was coming to the school somebody was going to be called out it could not be the committee whose pompous and uninspiring spring visit had taken place only the week before presently a well-dressed elderly man with an expectant masterful look stood on the doorstep glanced in with a smile and knocked miss marilla hender blushed smoothed her pretty hair anxiously with both hands and stepped down from her little platform to answer the summons there was hardly a shut mouth in the primer class would it be convenient for you to receive a visitor to the school the stranger asked politely with a fine bow of deference to miss hender he looked much pleased and a little excited and the teacher said certainly step right in won't you sir in quite another tone from that in which she had just addressed the school the boys and girls were sitting straight and silent in their places in something like a fit of apprehension and unpreparedness at such a great emergency the guest represented a type of person previously unknown in district number four everything about him spoke of wealth and authority the old dog returned to the doorstep and after a careful look at the invader approached him with a funny doggish grin and a desperate wag of the tail to beg for recognition the teacher gave her chair on the platform to the guest and stood beside him with very red cheeks smoothing her hair again once or twice and keeping the hardwood ruler fast in hand like a badge of office primer class may now retire she said firmly although the lesson was not more than half through and the class promptly escaped to their seats waddling and stumbling until they all came up behind their desk face foremost and added themselves to the number of staring young countenances after this there was a silence which grew more and more embarrassing perhaps you would be pleased to hear our first class in geography sir asked the fair marilla recovering her presence of mind and the guest kindly assented the young teacher was by no means willing to give up a certainty for an uncertainty yesterday's lesson had been well learned she turned back to the questions about the state of Kansota, and at the first sentence the mysterious visitor's dignity melted into an unconscious smile he listened intently for a minute and then seemed to reoccupy himself with his own thoughts and purposes looking eagerly about the old schoolhouse and sometimes gazing steadily at the children the lesson went on finally and when it was finished miss hender asked the girl at the head of the class to name the states and territories which she instantly did mispronouncing nearly all the names of the latter then others stated boundaries and capitals and the resources of the new england states passing on finally to the names of the presidents miss hender glowed with pride she had worked hard over the geography class in the winter term and it did not fail her on this great occasion when she turned bravely to see if the gentleman would like to ask any questions she found that he was apparently lost in a deep reverie so she repeated her own question more distinctly they have done very well very well indeed he answered kindly and then to everyone's surprise he rose went up the aisle pushed johnny spencer gently along his bench and sat down beside him the space was cramped 
and the stranger looked huge and uncomfortable, so that everybody laughed, except one of the big girls, who turned pale with fright and thought he must be crazy. When this girl gave a faint squeak, Miss Hinder recovered herself and rapped twice with the ruler to restore order, then became entirely tranquil. There had been talk of replacing the hacked and worn old school desks with patent desks and chairs. This was probably an agent connected with that business. At once she was resolute and self-reliant, and said, No whispering! in a firm tone that showed she did not mean to be trifled with. The geography class was dismissed, but the elderly gentleman in his handsome overcoat still sat there wedged in at Johnny Spencer's side. "'I presume, sir, that you are canvassing for new desks,' said Miss Hender, with dignity. "'You will have to see the supervisor and the selectman.' There did not seem to be any need of his lingering, but she had an ardent desire to be pleasing to a person of such evident distinction. We always tell strangers. I thought, sir, you might be gratified to know that this is the schoolhouse where the Honorable Joseph K. Laneway first attended school. All do not know that he was born in this town and went west very young. It is only about a mile from here where his folks used to live. At this moment, the visitor's eyes fell. He did not look at pretty Marilla any more, but opened Johnny Spencer's arithmetic, and, seeing the imaginary portrait of the great General Laneway, laughed a little. A very deep-down, comfortable laugh it was. While Johnny himself turned cold with alarm, he could not have told why. It was very still in the schoolroom. The bee was buzzing and bumping at the pane again. The moment was one of intense expectation. The stranger looked at the children, right and left. The fact is this, young people, said he, in a tone that was half pride and half apology. I am Joseph K. Laneway myself. He tried to extricate himself from the narrow quarters of the desk, but for an embarrassing moment found that he was stuck fast. Johnny Spencer instinctively gave him an assisting push, and once free, the great soldier, statesman, and millionaire took a few steps forward to the open floor. Then, after hesitating a moment, he mounted the little platform and stood in the teacher's place. Marilla Hender was as pale as ashes. "'I have thought many times,' the great guest began, that some day I should come back to visit this place, which is so closely interwoven with the memories of my childhood. In my counting-room, on the fields of war, in the halls of Congress, and most of all in my western home, my thoughts have flown back to the hills and brooks of Winby, and to this little old schoolhouse. I could shut my eyes and call back the buzz of voices, and fear my teacher's frown, and feel my boyish ambitions waking and stirring in my breast. On that bench where I just sat, I saw some notches that I cut with my first jackknife fifty-eight years ago this very spring. I remember the faces of the boys and girls who went to school with me, and I see their grandchildren before me. I know that one is a good so, and another a win by the old family look. One generation goes, and another comes. There are many things that I might say to you. I meant, even in those early restricted days, to make my name known, and I dare say that you too have ambition. Be careful what you wish for in this world, for if you wish hard enough, you are sure to get it. I once heard a very wise man say this, and the longer I live, the more firmly I believe it to be true. But wishing hard means working hard for what you want, and the world's prizes wait for the men and women who are ready to take pains to win them. Be careful and set your minds on the best things. I meant to be a rich man when I was a boy here, and I stand before you 
a rich man, knowing the care and anxiety and responsibility of wealth. I meant to go to Congress, and I am one of the senators from Kansota. I say this as humbly as I say it proudly. I used to read of the valor and patriotism of the old Greeks and Romans with my youthful blood leaping along my veins, and it came to pass that my own country was in danger, and that I could help to fight her battles. Perhaps some one of these little lads has before him a more eventful life than I have lived, and is looking forward to activity and honor and the pride of fame. I wish him all the joy that I have had, all the toll that I have had, and all the bitter disappointments, even. For adversity leads a man to depend upon that which is above him, and the path of glory is a lonely path, beset by temptations and a bitter sense of the weakness and imperfection of man. I see my life spread out like a great picture as I stand here in my boyhood's place. I regret my failures. I thank God for what in his kind providence has been honest and right. I am glad to come back, but I feel, as I look in your young faces, that I am an old man, while your lives are just beginning. When you remember, in years to come, that I came here to see the old schoolhouse, remember that I said, wish for the best things, and work hard to win them. Try to be good men and women, for the honor of the school and the town, and the noble young country that gave you birth. Be kind at home, and generous abroad. Remember that I, an old man who had seen much of life, begged you to be brave and good. The Honorable Mr. Langway had rarely felt himself so moved in any of his public speeches, but he was obliged to notice that for once he could not hold his audience. The primer class especially had begun to flag in attention, but one or two faces among the elder scholars fairly shone with vital sympathy and a lovely prescience of their future. Their eyes met his, as if they struck a flash of light. There was a sturdy boy who half rose in his place unconsciously, the color coming and going in his cheeks. Something in Mr. Laneway's words lit the altar flame in his reverent heart. Marilla Hender was pleased and a little dazed. She could not have repeated what her illustrious visitor had said, but she longed to tell everybody the news that he was in town and had come to school to make an address. She had never seen a great man before and really needed time to reflect upon him and to consider what she ought to say. She was just quivering with the attempt to make a proper reply and thank Mr. Laneway for the honor of his visit to the school, when he asked her which of the boys could be trusted to drive back his hired horse to the four corners. Eight boys, large and small, nearly every boy in the school, rose at once and snapped insistent fingers. But Johnny Spencer alone was desirous not to attract attention to himself. The Colburn's intellectual arithmetic with a portrait had been well secreted between his tight jacket and his shirt. Miss Hender selected a trustworthy, freckled person in long trousers who was halfway to the door in an instant and was heard almost immediately to shout loudly at the quiet horse. Then the hero of District Number 4 made his acknowledgments to the teacher. I fear that I have interrupted you too long, he said, with pleasing deference. Marilla replied that it was of no consequence. She hoped he would call again. She may have spoken primly, but her pretty eyes said everything that her lips forgot. My grandmother will want to see you, sir, she ventured to say. I guess you will remember her. Miss Hender, she that was Abby Heron. She has often told me how you used to get your lessons out of the same book. Abby Heron's granddaughter? Mr. Laneway looked at her again with fresh interest. Yes, I wish to see her more than anyone else. 
Tell her that I am coming to see her before I go away, and give her my love. Thank you, my dear, as Marilla offered his missing hat. Goodbye, boys and girls. He stopped and looked at them once more from the boys' entry, and turned again to look back from the very doorstep. Part Two The Honorable Mr. Laneway found the outdoor air very fresh and sweet after the closeness of the schoolhouse. It had just that same odor in his boyhood, and as he escaped, he had a delightful sense of playing truant or of having an unexpected holiday. It was easier to think of himself as a boy and to slip back into his boyish thoughts than to bear the familiar burden of his manhood. He climbed the tumble-down stone wall across the road and went along a narrow path to the spring that bubbled up clear and cold under a great red oak. How many times he had longed for a drink of that water, and now here it was, and the thirst of that warm spring day was hard to quench. Again and again he stopped to fill the birch bark dipper which the children had made, just as his own comrades made theirs years before. The oak tree was dying at the top. The pine woods beyond had been cut and had grown again since his boyhood and looked much as he remembered them beyond the spring and away from the woods the path led across overgrown pastures to another road perhaps three-quarters of a mile away and near this road was the small farm which had been his former home as he walked slowly along he was met again and again by some reminder of his youthful days he had always liked to refer to his early life in new england in his political addresses, and had spoken more than once of going to find the cows at nightfall in the autumn evenings, and being glad to warm his bare feet in the places where the sleepy beasts had lain, before he followed their slow steps homeward through bush and briar. The Honorable Mr. Laneway had a touch of true sentiment, which added much to his really stirring and effective campaign speeches. He had often been called the king of the platform in his adopted state. He had long ago grown used to saying, Go to one man and come to another, like the ruler of old. But all his natural power of leadership and habit of authority disappeared at once as he trod the pasture slopes, calling back the remembrance of his childhood. Here was the place where two lads, older than himself, had killed a terrible woodchuck at bay in the angle of a great rock. And just beyond was the sunny spot where he had picked a bunch of pink and white anemones under a prickly barbary thicket to give to Abby Harron in morning school. She had put them into her desk and let them wilt there, but she was pleased when she took them. Abby Harron, the little teacher's grandmother, was a year older than he, and had wakened the earliest thought of love in his youthful breast. It was almost time to catch the first sight of his birthplace. From the knoll, just ahead, he had often seen the light of his mother's lamp as he came home from school on winter afternoons. But when he reached the knoll, the old house was gone, and so was the great walnut tree that grew beside it. And a pang of disappointment shot through this devout pilgrim's heart. He never had doubted that the old farm was somebody's home still, and had counted upon the pleasure of spending a night there, and sleeping again in that room under the roof, where the rain sounded loud, and the walnut branches brushed to and fro when the wind blew, as if they were the claws of tigers. He hurried across the worn-out fields, long ago turned into sheep pastures, where the last year's tall grass and goldenrod stood gray and winter killed, tracing the old walls and fences, and astonished to see how small the fields had been. The prosperous owner of western farming lands could not help remembering those widespread luxuriant acres and the broad outlooks of his western home. It was difficult at first to find exactly where the house had stood. Even the foundations had disappeared. At last, 
in the long, faded grass, he discovered the doorstep, and nearby was a little mound where the great walnut tree stump had been. The cellar was a mere dent in the sloping ground. It had been filled in by the growing grass and slow processes of summer and winter weather. But just at the pilgrim's right were some thorny twigs of an old rose bush. A sudden brightening of memory brought to mind the love that his mother, dead since his fifteenth year, had kept for this sweet briar. How often she had wished that she had brought it to her new home. So much had changed in the world, so many had gone into the world of light, and here the faithful blooming thing was yet alive. There was one slender branch where green buds were starting and getting ready to flower in the new year. The afternoon wore late, and still the gray-haired man lingered. He might have laughed at someone else, who gave himself up to sad thoughts and found fault with himself with no defendant to plead his cause at the bar of conscience. It was an altogether lonely hour. He had dreamed all his life, in a sentimental, self-satisfied fashion, of this return to Winby. It had always appeared to be a grand affair, but so far he was himself the only interested spectator at his poor occasion. There was even a dismal consciousness that he had been undignified, perhaps even a little consequential and silly in the old schoolhouse. The picture of himself on the warpath in Johnny Spencer's arithmetic was the only tribute that this longed-for day had held, but he laughed aloud delightedly at the remembrance, and really liked that solemn little boy who sat at his own old desk. There was another older lad who sat at the back of the room, who reminded Mr. Laneway of himself in his eager youth. There was a spark of light in that fellow's eyes. Once or twice in the earlier afternoon, as he drove along, he had asked people in the road if there were a Laneway family in that neighborhood, but everybody had said no in indifferent fashion. Somehow he had been expecting that everyone would know him and greet him and give him credit for what he had tried to do. But old Winby had her own affairs to look after, and did very well without any of his help. Mr. Laneway acknowledged to himself at this point that he was weak and unmanly. There must be some old friends who would remember him, and give him as hearty a welcome as the greeting he had brought for them. So he rose and went his way westward toward the sunset. The air was growing damp and cold, and it was time to make sure of shelter. This was hardly like the visit he had meant to pay his birthplace. He wished with all his heart that he had never come back. But he walked briskly away, intent upon wider thoughts, as the fresh evening breeze quickened his steps. He did not consider where he was going, but was, for a time, the busy man of affairs, stimulated by the unconscious influence of his surroundings. The slender gray birches and pitch pines of that neglected pasture had never before seen a hat and coat exactly in the fashion. They may have been abashed by the presence of a United States senator and western millionaire, though a piece of New England ground that had often felt the tread of his bare feet was not likely to quake because a pair of smart shoes stepped hastily along the schoolhouse path. Part 3 There was an imperative knock at the side door of the Hinder farmhouse just after dark. The young schoolmistress had come home late because she had stopped all the way along to give people the news of her afternoon's experience. Morella was not coy and speechless any longer, but sat by the kitchen stove telling her eager grandmother everything she could remember or could imagine. "'Who's that knocking at the door?' interrupted Mrs. Hender. "'No, I'll go myself. I'm nearest.' The man outside was cold and footwear. He was not used to spending a whole day unrecognized, and, after 
being first amused and even enjoying a sense of freedom at, at escaping his just dues of consideration and respect he had begun to feel as if he were old and forgotten and was hardly sure of a friend in the world old mrs hender came to the door with her eyes shining with delight in great haste to dismiss whoever had knocked so that she might hear the rest of marilla's story she opened the door wide to whoever might have come on some country errand and looked the tired and faint-hearted mr laneway full in the face dear heart come in she exclaimed reaching out and taking him by the shoulder as he stood humbly on a lower step come right in joe why i should know you anywhere why joe laneway you same boy in they went to the warm bright country kitchen the delight and kindness of an old friend's welcome and her instant sympathy seemed the loveliest thing in the world they sat down in two old straight-backed kitchen chairs they still held each other by the hand and looked in each other's face the plain old room was aglow with heat and cheerfulness the tea kettle was singing a drowsy cat sat on the wood box with her paws tucked in and the house dog came forward in a friendly way wagging his tail and laid his head on their clasped hands and to think i haven't seen you since your folks moved out west the next spring after you were thirteen in the winter said the good woman but i suppose there ain't been anybody that has followed your career closer than i have according to their opportunities you've done a great work for your country joe i'm proud of you clean through sometimes folks has said there there miss hender what be you goin to say now but i've always told em to wait i knew you saw your reasons you was always an honest boy the tears started and shone in her kind eyes her face showed that she had waged a bitter war with poverty and sorrow but the look of affection that it wore and the warm touch of her hard hand misshapen and worn with toil touched her old friend in his inmost heart and for a moment neither could speak they do say that women folks have got no natural head for politics but i always could seem to sense what was going on in washington if there was any sense to it said grandmother hender at last nobody could puzzle you at school i remember answered mr laneway and they both laughed heartily but surely this granddaughter does not make your household you have sons two beside her father he died but they're both away up toward canada buying cattle we are getting along considerable well these last few years since they got a mite of capital together but the old farm wasn't really able to maintain us with the heavy expenses that fell on us unexpected year by year i've seen a great sight of trouble joe my boy john marilla's father and his nice wife i lost em both early when marilla was but a child john was the flower of my family he would have made a name for himself you would have taken to john i was sorry to hear of your loss said mr laneway he was a brave man i know what he did at fredericksburg you remember that i lost my wife and my only son there was a silence between the friends who had no need for words now they understood each other's heart only too well marilla who sat near them rose and went out of the room yes yes daughter said mrs hender calling her back we ought to be thinking about supper i was going to light a little fire in the parlor explained marilla with a slight tone of rebuke in her clear girlish voice oh no you ain't not now at least protested the elder woman decidedly now joseph what should you like to have for supper i wish to my heart i had some fried turnovers like those you used to come after when you was a boy i can make em just about the same as mother did i'll be bound you've thought of some old-fashioned dish that you'd relish for your supper rye drop cakes 
then, if they wouldn't give you too much trouble, answered the Honorable Joseph with prompt seriousness, and don't forget some cheese. He looked up at his old playfellow as she stood beside him, eager with affectionate hospitality. You've no idea what a comfort Marilla's been, she stopped to whisper. Always took right hold and helped me when she was a baby. She's as good as made up already to me for my having no daughter. I want you to get acquainted with Marilla. The granddaughter was still awed and anxious about the entertainment of so distinguished a guest when her grandmother appeared at last in the pantry. I ain't going to let you do no such a thing, darling, said Abby Hinder, when Marilla spoke of making something that she called fairy gems for tea, after a new and essentially feminine recipe. You just let me get supper tonight. The general has enough kickshaws to eat. He wants a good, hearty, old-fashioned supper, the same country cooking he remembers when he was a boy. He went so far himself as to speak of rye drop cakes, and there ain't one in a hundred nowadays knows how to make the kind he means. You go and lay the table just as we always have it, except you can get out them old big sprig cups o' oh, my mother's. Don't put on none of the parlor closet things. Marilla went off crestfallen and demurring. She had a noble desire to show Mr. Laneway that they knew how to have things as well as anybody, and was sure that he would consider it more polite to be asked into the best room, and to sit there alone until tea was ready. But the illustrious Mr. Laneway was allowed to stay in the kitchen, in apparent happiness, and to watch the proceedings from beginning to end. The two old friends talked industriously, but he saw his ride drop cakes go into the oven and come out and his tea made and his piece of salt fish broiled and buttered a broad piece of honeycomb set on to match some delightful thick slices of brown crusted loaf bread and all the simple feast prepared there was a sufficient piece of abby hinder's best cheese it must be confessed that there were also some baked beans and as one thing after another appeared the honorable joseph k laneway grew hungrier and hungrier until he fairly looked pale with anticipation and delay and was bidden at that very moment to draw up his chair and make himself a supper if he could what cups of tea what uncounted rye drop cakes went to the making of that successful supper how gay the two old friends became and of what old stories they reminded each other, and how late the dark spring evening grew, before the feast was over, and the straight back chairs were set against the kitchen wall. Marilla listened for a long time with more or less interest, but at last she took one of her school books, with slight ostentation, and went over to study by the lamp. Mrs. Hunter had brought her knitting work, a blue woolen stocking, out of a drawer, and sat down serene and unruffled, prepared to keep awake as late as possible. She was a woman who had kept her youthful looks through the difficulties of farm life as few women can, and this added to her guest's sense of homelikeness and pleasure. There was something that he felt to be sisterly and comfortable in her strong figure. He even noticed the little plaid woolen shawl that she wore about her shoulders. Dear, uncomplaining heart of Abby Hender. The appealing friendliness of the good woman made no demands except to be allowed to help and to serve everybody who came in her way. Now began, in good earnest, the talk of old times, and what had become of this and that old schoolmate. How one family had come to want and another to wealth. The change and losses and windfalls of good fortune in that rural neighborhood were made tragedy and comedy by turns in Abby Hender's dramatic speech. She grew younger and more entertaining hour by hour and beguiled the grave senator into confidential talk of national affairs. He had much to say, to which she listened with rare sympathy and intelligence. She astonished him by her comprehension of difficult questions of the day, and by her simple good sense. Marilla grew 
hopelessly sleepy, and departed, but neither of them turned to notice her as she lingered a moment at the door to say good night. When the immediate subjects of conversation were fully discussed, however, there was an unexpected interval of silence, and, after making sure that her knitting stitches counted exactly right, Abby Hender cast a questioning glance at the senator to see if he had it in mind to go to bed. She was reluctant to end her evening so soon, but determined to act the part of considerate hostess. The guest was as wide awake as ever. Eleven o'clock was the best part of his evening. Cider, he suggested, with an expectant smile, and Abby Hender was on her feet in a moment. When she had brought a pitcher from the pantry, he took a candle from the high shelf and led the way. To think of your remembering our old cellar candlestick all these years, laughed the pleased woman as she followed him down the steep stairway and then laughed still more at his delight in the familiar look of the place. Unchanged as the pyramids, he said. I suppose those pound sweetings that used to be in that farthest bin were eaten up months ago? It was plain to see that the household stores were waning low, as befitted the time of year, but there was still enough in the old cellar. Care and thrift and gratitude made the poor farmhouse a rich place. This woman of real ability had spent her strength from youth to age, and had lavished as much industry and power of organization in her narrow sphere as would have made her famous in a wider one. Joseph Laneway could not help sighing as he thought of it. How many things this good friend had missed, and yet how much she had been able to win that makes everywhere the very best of life. Poor and early widowed, there must have been a constant battle with poverty on that stony heron farm, whose owners had been pitied even in his early boyhood, when the best of farming life was none too easy. But Abby Hinder had always been one of the leaders of the town. Now, before we sit down again, I want you to step into my best room. Perhaps you won't have time in the morning, and I've got something to show you, she said persuasively. It was a plain, old-fashioned best room, with a look of pleasantness in spite of the spring chill and the stiffness of the best chairs. They lingered before the picture of Mrs. Hinder's soldier son a poor work of a poorer artist in crayons, but the spirit of the young face shone out appealingly. Then they crossed the room and stood before some bookshelves, and Abby Hender's face brightened into a beaming smile of triumph. You didn't expect we should have all those books now, did you, Joe Laneway? she asked. He shook his head soberly and leaned forward to read the titles. There were no very new ones, as if times had been hard of late. Almost every volume was either history or biography or travel. Their owner had reached out of her own narrow boundaries into other lives and to far countries. He recognized with gratitude two or three congressional books that he had sent her when he first went to Washington. And there was a life of himself written from a partisan point of view and issued in one of his most exciting campaigns. The sight of it touched him to the heart, and then she opened it and showed him the three or four letters that he had written her, one in boyish handwriting describing his adventures on his first western journey. There are a hundred and six volumes now, announced the proud owner of such a library. I lend them all I can, or most of them would look better. I have had to wait a good while for some, and some weren't what I expected them um, to be. But most of them's as good books as there is in the world. I've never been so situated that it seemed best for me to indulge in a daily paper, and I don't know, but it's just as well. But stories were never any great of a temptation. I know pretty well what's going on about me, and I can make that do. Real life's interesting enough for me. Mr. Laneway was still looking over the books. His heart smote him for not being thoughtful. He knew well enough that the overflow of his own library would have been delightful to the self-denying, eager-minded, 
soul. I've been a very busy man all my life, Abby, he said impulsively, as if she waited for some apology for his forgetfulness. But I'll see to it now that you have what you want to read. I don't mean to lose hold of your advice on state matters. They both laughed, and he added, I have always thought of you, if I haven't shown it. There's more time to read than there used to be. I've had what was best for me, answered the woman gently, with a grateful look on her face, as she turned to glance at her old friend. Marilla takes hold wonderfully and helps me with the work. In the long winter evenings, you can't think what a treat a new book is. I wouldn't change places with the queen. They had come back to the kitchen, and she stood before the cupboard, reaching high for two old gaily striped crockery mugs. There were some doughnuts and cheese at hand. Their early supper seemed quite forgotten. The kitchen was warm, and they had talked themselves thirsty and hungry. But with what an unexpected tang the cider freshened their throats! Mrs. Hender had picked the apples herself that went to the press. They were all chosen from the old russet tree, and the gnarly, red-cheeked, ungrafted fruit that grew along the lane. The flavor made one think of frosty autumn mornings on high hillsides, of north winds and sunny skies. It livens one to the heart, as Mrs. Hender remarked proudly, when the senator tried to praise it as much as it deserved, and finally gave a cheerful laugh, such as he had not laughed for many a day. Why, it seems like drinking the month of October, he told her. And at this, the hostess reached over, protesting that the striped mug was too narrow to hold what it ought, and filled it up again. Oh, Joe Laneway, to think that I see you at last, after all these years, she said. How rich I shall feel with this evening to live over. I've always wanted to see somebody that I'd read about, and now I've got that to remember. But I've always known I should see you again, and I believe it was the Lord's will. Early the next morning, they said goodbye. The early breakfast had to be hurried, and Marilla was to drive Mr. Laneway to the station, three miles away. It was Saturday morning, and she was free from school. Mr. Laneway strolled down the lane before breakfast was ready, and came back with a little bunch of pink anemones in his hand. Marilla thought that he meant to give them to her, but he laid them beside her grandmother's plate. "'You mustn't put those in your desk,' he said with a smile, and Abby Hunter blushed like a girl. "'I've got those others now, dried, and put away somewhere in one of my books,' she said quietly and Marilla wondered what they meant. The two old friends shook hands warmly at parting. I wish you could have stayed another day so I could have had the minister come and see you, urged Mrs. Hender regretfully. You couldn't have done any more for me. I have had the best visit in the world, he answered, a little shaken, and holding her hand a moment longer, while Marilla sat, young and impatient, in the high wagon. You're a dear, good woman, Abby. Sometimes when things have gone wrong, I've been sorry that I ever had to leave Winby. The woman's clear eyes looked straight into his, then fell. You wouldn't have done everything you have for the country, she said. Give me a kiss. We're getting to be old folks now, said the general, and they kissed each other gravely. A moment later, Abby Hender stood alone in her dooryard, watching and waving her hand again and again, while the wagon rattled away down the lane and turned into the high road. Two hours after, Marilla returned from the station and rushed into the kitchen. Grandma, she exclaimed, you never did see such a crowd in Winby as there was at the depot. Everybody in town had got word about General Laneway, and they were pushing up to shake hands and cheering same as at election. And the cars waited much as ten minutes, and all the folks was looking out of the windows and came out on the platforms when they heard who it was. Folks say that he'd been to see 
the selectman yesterday before he came to school and he's going to build an elegant town hall and have the names put up in it of all the winby men that went to the war marilla sank into a chair flushed with excitement everybody was asking me about his being here last night and what he said to the school i wish that you'd gone down to the depot instead of me i had the best part of anybody said mrs hender smiling and going on with her saturday morning work i'm real glad they showed him proper respect she added a moment afterward but her voice faltered why you ain't been crying grandma asked the girl i guess you're tired you had a real good time now didn't you yes dear heart said abby hender tain't pleasant to be growing old that's all i couldn't help noticing his age as he rode away i've always been looking forward to seeing him again and now it's all over end of section three a native of wimby by sarah orne jewett Section 4 of 1891 Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Perard. 1891 Collection by Various. Section 4. Soups. General Instructions by A.G. Payne. There are very few persons, unless they have made vegetarian cookery a study, who are aware what a great variety of soups can be made without the use of meat or fish. As a rule, ordinary cookery books have the one exception of what is called soup magri. In England, it seems to be the impression that the goodness of a soup depends upon the amount of nourishment that can be compressed into a small space. It is, however, a great mistake to think that because we take a large amount of nourishment we are necessarily nourished there is a limit though what that limit is no one can say beyond which soup becomes absolutely injurious a quarter of a pound of liebig's extract of meat dissolved in half a pint of water is obviously an overdose of what is considered nourishment in france as a rule soup is prepared on an altogether different idea it is a light thin broth taken at the commencement of the meal to strengthen the stomach in order to render it capable of receiving more substantial food to follow vegetarian soups are of course to be considered from this latter point of view we think these few preliminary observations necessary as we have to overcome a very strong english prejudice which is too apt to despise everything of which the remark can be made, ah, but there is very little nourishment in it. Vegetarian soups, as a rule, and especially the thin ones, must be regarded as a light and pleasant flavoring, which, with a small piece of white bread, enables the most obstinately delicate stomach to commence a repast that experience has found best adapted to its requirements. The basis of all soup is stock, and in making stock we, of course, have to depend upon vegetables, fruit, or some kind of farinaceous food. To a certain extent, the water in which any kind of vegetable has been boiled may be regarded as stock, especially water that has boiled roots, such as potatoes, or grains, such as rice. It will not however be necessary to enter into any general description as to the best method of obtaining nutriment in a liquid form from vegetables and grain as directions will be given in each recipe but a few words are necessary on the general subject of flavoring stock in making ordinary soup we are very much dependent for flavor if the soup be good on the meat the vegetables acting only as accessories in making stock for vegetarian soups we are chiefly dependent for flavor on the vegetables themselves 
and consequently great care must be taken that these flavorings are properly blended. The great difficulty in giving directions in cookery books and in understanding them when given is the insuperable one of avoiding vague expressions. For example, suppose we read, take two onions, one carrot, one turnip, and one head of celery. What does this mean? It will be found practically that these directions vary considerably according to the neighborhood or part of the country in which we live. For instance, so much depends upon where we take our head of celery from. Suppose we bought our head of celery in Bond Street or in the Central Arcade in Covent Garden Market on the one hand, or off a barrow in the Mile End Road on the other. Again, onions vary so much in size that we cannot draw any hard and fast line between a little pickling onion no bigger than a marble and a Spanish onion as big as a baby's head. It would be possible to be very precise and say, take so many ounces of celery or so many pounds of carrot, but practically we cannot turn the kitchen into a chemist's shop. Cooks, whether told to use celery in heads or ounces, would act on guesswork just the same. What are absolutely essential are two things, common sense and experience. Again, practically, we must avoid giving too many ingredients. Novices in the art of cooking are, of course, unable to distinguish between those vegetables that are absolutely essential and those added to give a slight extra flavor, but which make very little difference to the soup whether they are added or not. We are often directed to add a few leaves of tarragon or chervil, or a handful of sorrel. Of course, in a large kitchen presided over by a francatelli, these are easily obtainable. But in ordinary private houses, and in most parts of the country, they are not only unobtainable, but have never even been heard of at the greengrocer's shop. In making soups, as a rule, the four vegetables essential are onion, celery, carrot, and turnip, and we place them in their order of merit. In making vegetarian soup, it is very important that we should learn how to blend these without making any one flavor too predominant. This can only be learnt by experience. If we have too much onion, the soup tastes rank. Too much celery will make it bitter. Too much carrot often renders the soup sweet, and the turnip overpowers every other flavor. Again, these vegetables vary so much in strength that were we to peel and weigh them, the result would not be uniform. In addition to the fact that not one cook in a thousand would take the trouble to do it. Perhaps the most dangerous vegetable with which we have to deal is turnip. These vary so very much in strength that sometimes even one slice of turnip will be found too strong. In flavoring soups with these vegetables, the first care should be to see that they are thoroughly cleansed. In using celery, too much of the green part should be avoided if you wish to make a first-rate soup. In using the onions, if they are old and strong, the core can be removed. In using carrot, if you are going to have any soup where vegetables will be cut up and served in the soup, you should always peel off the outside red part of the carrot and reserve it for this purpose, and only use the inside or yellow part for flavoring purposes if it is going to be thrown away or to lose its identity by being rubbed through a wire sieve with other vegetables. With regard to turnip, we can only add one word of caution not too much. We may here mention, before leaving the subject of ingredients, that leeks and garlic are a substitute for onion and can also be used in conjunction with it. As a rule, in vegetarian cookery, clear soups are rare, and of course, from an economical point of view, they are not to be compared with thick soups. Some persons, in making stock, recommend what is termed bran tea, Half a pint of bran is boiled in about three pints of water, and a certain amount of nutriment can be extracted from the bran, which also imparts color. 
For the purpose of coloring clear soups, however, there is nothing in the world to compare with what French cooks call caramel. Caramel is really burnt sugar. There is a considerable art in preparing it, as it is necessary that it should impart color, and color only. When prepared in the rough and ready manner of burning sugar in a spoon, as is too often practiced in English kitchens, this desideratum is never attained, as you are bound to impart sweetness in addition to a burnt flavor. The simplest and by far the most economical method of using caramel is to buy it ready-made. It is sold by all grocers under the name of Parisian essence. A small bottle, costing about eight pence, will last a year, and saves an infinite loss of time, trouble, and temper. By far the most economical soups are the thick, where all the ingredients can be rubbed through a wire sieve. Thick soups can be divided into two classes, ordinary brown soup and white soup. The ordinary brown is the most economical, as in white soups, milk is essential, and if the soup is wished to be very good, it is necessary to add a little cream. Soups owe their thickness to two processes. We can thicken the soup by adding flour of various kinds, such as ordinary flour, corn flour, etc., and soup can also be thickened by having some of the ingredients of which it is composed rubbed through a sieve. This class of soups may be called purees. For instance, Palestine soup is really a puree of Jerusalem artichokes. Ordinary pea soup is a puree of split peas. In making our ordinary vegetarian soups of all kinds, as a rule, all the ingredients should be rubbed through a sieve. The economy of this is obvious on the face of it. In the case of thickening soup by means of some kinds of flour, for richness and flavor, there is nothing to equal ordinary flour that has been cooked. This is what Frenchmen call roux. As white and brown roux are the very backbone of vegetarian cookery, a few words of explanation may not be out of place. On referring to the recipe for making white and brown roux, it will be seen that it is simply flour cooked by means of frying it in butter. In white roux, each grain of flour is cooked till it is done. In brown roux, each grain of flour is cooked till it is done brown. We cannot exaggerate the importance of getting cooks to see the enormous difference between thickening soups or gravy with white or brown roux, and simply thickening them with plain butter and flour. The taste of the soup in the two cases is altogether different. The difference is this. Suppose you have just been making some pastry, some good, rich, puff paste. You've got two pies, and as you probably know, this pastry is simply butter and flour. Place one pie in the oven and bake it till it is a nice, rich brown. Now taste the pie crust. It is probably delicious. Now taste the piece of the pie that has not been baked at all. It is nauseous. The difference is, one is butter and flour that has been cooked, the other is butter and flour that has not been cooked. One word of warning in conclusion. Cooks should always remember the good old saying that it is quite possible to have too much of a good thing. They should be particularly warned to bear this in mind in adding herbs, such as ordinary mixed flavoring herbs, or as they are sometimes called, savory herbs, and thyme. This is also very important if wine is added to soup, though as a rule vegetarians rarely use wine in cooking. But the same principle applies to the substitute for wine, viz. lemon juice. It is equally important to bear this in mind in using white and brown roux. If we make the soup too thick, we spoil it, and it is necessary to add water to bring it to a proper consistency, which, of course, diminishes the flavor. The proper consistency of any soup thickened with roux should be that of ordinary cream. Beyond this point, the cooked flour will overpower almost every other flavor 
and the great beauty of vegetarian cookery is its simplicity it appeals to a taste that is refined and natural and not to one that has been depraved end of section four soups general instructions by a g payne section five of eighteen ninety one collection mrs manstey's view by edith wharton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perard eighteen ninety one collection by various section five mrs manstey's view by edith wharton as first published in scribner's magazine july eighteen ninety one the view from mrs manstey's window was not a striking one but to her at least it was full of interest and beauty mrs manstey occupied the back room on the third floor of a new york boarding-house in a street where the ash barrels lingered late on the sidewalk and the gaps in the pavement would have staggered a quintus courteous she was the widow of a clerk in a large wholesale house and his death had left her alone for her only daughter had married in california and could not afford the long journey to new york to see her mother mrs manstey perhaps might have joined her daughter in the west but they had now been so many years apart that they had ceased to feel any need of each other's society and their intercourse had long been limited to the exchange of a few perfunctory letters written with indifference by the daughter and with difficulty by mrs manstey whose right hand was growing stiff with gout even had she felt a stronger desire for her daughter's companionship mrs manstey's increasing infirmity which caused her to dread the three flights of stairs between her room and the street would have given her pause on the eve of undertaking so long a journey and without perhaps formulating these reasons she had long since accepted as a matter of course her solitary life in new york she was indeed not quite lonely for a few friends still toiled up now and then to her room but their visits grew rare as the years went by mrs manstey had never been a sociable woman and during her husband's lifetime his companionship had been all sufficient to her for many years she had cherished a desire to live in the country to have a henhouse and a garden but this longing had faded with age leaving only in the breast of the uncommunicative old woman a vague tenderness for plants and animals it was perhaps this tenderness which made her cling so fervently to her view from her window a view in which the most optimistic eye would at first have failed to discover anything admirable mrs manstey from her coin of vantage a slightly projecting bow window where she nursed an ivy and a succession of unwholesome-looking bulbs looked out first upon the yard of her own dwelling of which however she could get but a restricted glimpse still her gaze took in the topmost boughs of the alianthus below her window and she knew how early each year the clump of dicentra strung its bending stalk with hearts of pink but of greater interest were the yards beyond being for the most part attached to boarding-houses they were in a state of chronic untidiness and fluttering on certain days of the week with miscellaneous garments and frayed tablecloths in spite of this mrs manstey found much to admire in the long vista which she commanded some of the yards were indeed but stony wastes with grass in the cracks of the pavement and no shade in spring save that afforded by the intermittent leafage of the clotheslines these yards mrs manstey disapproved of but the others the green ones she loved she had grown used to their disorder the broken barrels the empty bottles and paths unswept no longer annoyed her 
Hers was the happy faculty of dwelling on the pleasanter side of the prospect before her. In the very next enclosure, did not a magnolia open its hard white flowers against the watery blue of April? And was there not, a little way down the line, a fence foamed over every May by lilac waves of wistaria? Farther still, a horse chestnut lifted its candelabra of buff and pink blossoms above broad fans of foliage, while, in the opposite yard, June was sweet with the breath of a neglected syringa, which persisted in growing in spite of the countless obstacles opposed to its welfare. But if nature occupied the front rank in Mrs. Manstey's view, there was much of a more personal character to interest her in the aspect of the house and their inmates. She deeply disapproved of the mustard-colored curtains which had lately been hung in the doctor's window opposite, but she glowed with pleasure when the house farther down had its old bricks washed with a coat of paint. The occupants of the houses did not often show themselves at the back windows, but the servants were always in sight. Noisy slatterns, Mrs. Manstey pronounced the greater number. She knew their ways and hated them. But to the quiet cook in the newly painted house, whose mistress bullied her and who secretly fed the stray cats at nightfall, Mrs. Manstey's warmest sympathies were given. On one occasion, her feelings were racked by the neglect of a housemaid, who, for two days, forgot to feed the parrot committed to her care. On the third day, Mrs. Manstey, in spite of her gouty hand, had just penned a letter, beginning, Madam, it is now three days since your parrot has been fed, when the forgetful maid appeared at the window with a cup of seed in her hand. But in Mrs. Manstey's more meditative moods, it was the narrowing perspective of far-off yards which pleased her best. She loved, at twilight, when the distant brown stone spire seemed melting in the fluid yellow of the west, to lose herself in vague memories of a trip to Europe made years ago, and now reduced in her mind's eye to a pale phantasmagoria of indistinct steeples and dreamy skies. Perhaps, at heart, Mrs. Manstey was an artist. At all events, she was sensible of many changes of color unnoticed by the average eye, and dear to her as the green of early spring was the black lattice of branches against a cold sulphur sky at the close of a snowy day. She enjoyed, also, the sunny thaws of March, when patches of earth showed through the snow like ink spots spreading on a sheet of white blotting paper, and, better still, the haze of boughs, leafless but swollen, which replaced the clear-cut tracery of winter. She even watched, with a certain interest, the trail of smoke from a far-off factory chimney, and missed a detail in the landscape when the factory was closed and the smoke disappeared. Mrs. Manstey, in the long hours which she spent at her window, was not idle. She read a little, and knitted numberless stockings, but the view surrounded and shaped her life as the sea does a lonely island. When her rare callers came, it was difficult for her to detach herself from the contemplation of the opposite window washing, or the scrutiny of certain green points in a neighboring flower bed, which might, or might not, turn into hyacinths, while she feigned an interest in her visitors' anecdotes about some unknown grandchild. Mrs. Manstey's real friends were the denizens of the yards, the hyacinths, the magnolia, the green parrot, the maid who fed the cats, the doctor who studied late behind his mustard-colored curtains, and the confidant of her tender musings was the church spire floating in the sunset. One April day, as she sat in her usual place, with knitting cast aside and eyes fixed on the blue sky mottled with round clouds, a knock at the door announced the entrance of her landlady. 
Mrs. Manstey did not care for her landlady, but she submitted to her visits with ladylike resignation. Today, however, it seemed harder than usual to turn from the blue sky and the blossoming magnolia to Mrs. Sampson's unsuggestive face, and Mrs. Manstey was conscious of a distinct effort as she did so. The magnolia is out earlier than usual this year, Mrs. Sampson, she remarked, yielding to a rare impulse, for she seldom alluded to the absorbing interests of her life. In the first place, it was a topic not likely to appeal to her visitors, and besides, she lacked the power of expression, and could not have given utterance to her feelings had she wished to. The what, Mrs. Manstey? inquired the landlady glancing about the room as if to find there the explanation of Mrs. Manstey's statement. The magnolia in the next yard, in Mrs. Black's yard, Mrs. Manstey repeated. Is it indeed? I didn't know there was a magnolia there, said Mrs. Sampson carelessly. Mrs. Manstey looked at her. She did not know there was a magnolia in the next yard. By the way, Mrs. Sampson continued. Speaking of Mrs. Black reminds me that the work on the extension is to begin next week. The what? It was Mrs. Manstey's turn to ask. The extension, said Mrs. Sampson, nodding her head in the direction of the ignored magnolia. You knew, of course, that Mrs. Black was going to build an extension to her house. Yes, ma'am, I hear it is to run right back to the end of the yard. How she can afford to build an extension in these hard times, I don't see. But she always was crazy about building. She used to keep a boarding house in 17th Street, and she nearly ruined herself then by sticking out bow windows and what not. I should have thought that would have cursed her of building, but I guess it's a disease, like drink. Anyhow, the work is to begin on Monday. Mrs. Manstey had grown pale. She always spoke slowly, so the landlady did not heed the long pause which followed. At last, Mrs. Manstey said, Do you know how high the extension will be? That's the most absurd part of it. The extension is to be built right up to the roof of the main building. Now, did you ever... Mrs. Manstey paused again. Won't it be a great annoyance to you, Mrs. Sampson? she asked. I should say it would, but there's no help for it. If people have got a mind to build extensions, there's no law to prevent them that I'm aware of. Mrs. Manstey, knowing this, was silent. There is no help for it, Mrs. Sampson repeated. But if I am a church member, I wouldn't be so sorry if it ruined Eliza Black. Well, good day, Mrs. Manstey. I'm glad to find you so comfortable. So comfortable. So comfortable. Left to herself, the old woman turned once more to the window. How lovely the view was that day. The blue sky with its round clouds shed a brightness over everything. The ailanthus had put on a tinge of yellow-green. The hyacinths were budding. The magnolia flowers looked more than ever like rosettes carved in alabaster. Soon the wisteria would bloom, then the horse chestnut, but not for her. Between her eyes and them, a barrier of brick and mortar would swiftly rise. Presently, even the spire would disappear, and all her radiant world be blotted out. Mrs. Manstey sent away, untouched, the dinner tray brought to her that evening. She lingered in the window until the windy sunset died in bat-colored dusk. Then, going to bed, she lay sleepless all night. Early the next day, she was up and at the window. It was raining, but even through the slanting gray gauze, the scene had its charm. And then the rain was so good for the trees. She had noticed the day before that the ailanthus was growing dusty. Of course, I might move, 
said Miss Manstey aloud, and, turning from the window, she looked about her room. She might move, of course. So might she be flayed alive. But she was not likely to survive either operation. The room, though far less important to her happiness than the view, was as much a part of her existence. She had lived in it seventeen years. She knew every stain on the wallpaper, every rent in the carpet. The light fell in a certain way on her engravings. Her books had grown shabby on their shelves. Her bulbs and ivy were used to their window and knew which way to lean to the sun. We are all too old to move, she said. That afternoon it cleared, wet and radiant. The blue reappeared through torn rags of cloud. The ailanthus sparkled. The earth in the flower borders looked rich and warm. It was Thursday, and on Monday the building of the extension was to begin. On Sunday afternoon a card was brought to Mrs. Black, as she was engaged in gathering up the fragments of the boarders' dinner in the basement. The card, black-edged, bore Mrs. Manstey's name. One of Mrs. Sampson's boarders wants to move, I suppose. Well, I can give her a room next year in the extension. Dinah, said Mrs. Black, tell the lady I'll be upstairs in a minute. Mrs. Black found Mrs. Manstey standing in the long parlor, garnished with statuettes and antimacassars. In that house, she could not sit down. Stooping hurriedly to open the register, which let out a cloud of dust, Mrs. Black advanced on her visitor. "'I'm happy to meet you, Mrs. Manstey. Take a seat, please,' the landlady remarked in her prosperous voice, the voice of a woman who can afford to build extensions. There was no help for it. Mrs. Manstey sat down. "'Is there anything I can do for you, ma'am?' Mrs. Black continued. "'My house is full at present, but I am going to build an extension, and—' "'It is about the extension that I wish to speak,' said Mrs. Manstey, suddenly. "'I am a poor woman, Mrs. Black, and I have never been a happy one. I shall have to talk about myself first, to—' To make you understand. Mrs. Black, astonished but imperturbable, bowed at this parenthesis. I never had what I wanted, Mrs. Manstey continued. It was always one disappointment after another. For years I wanted to live in the country. I dreamed and dreamed about it, but we never could manage it. There was no sunny window in our house, and so all my plants died. My daughter married years ago and went away. Besides, she never cared for the same things. Then my husband died and I was left alone. That was seventeen years ago. I went to live at Mrs. Sampson's, and I have been there ever since. I have grown a little infirm, as you see, and I don't get out often, only on fine days, if I am feeling very well. So... You can understand my sitting a great deal in my window, the back window, on the third floor. Well, Mrs. Manstey, said Mrs. Black, liberally, I could give you a back room, I dare say, one of the new rooms and the X. But I don't want to move. I can't move, said Mrs. Manstey, almost with a scream. And I came to tell you that if you build that extension, I shall have no view from my window. No view. Do you understand? Mrs. Black thought herself face to face with a lunatic, and she had always heard that lunatics must be humored. Dear me, dear me, she remarked, pushing her chair back a little way. That is too bad, isn't it? Why, I never thought of that. To be sure, the extension will interfere with your view, Mrs. Manstey. You do understand, Mrs. Manstey gasped. Of course I do, and I'm real sorry about it, too. But there, don't you worry, Mrs. Manstey. I guess we can fix that all right. Mrs. Manstey rose from her seat, and Mrs. Black slipped toward the door. What do you mean by fixing it? 
Do you mean that I can induce you to change your mind about the extension? Oh, Mrs. Black, listen to me. I have $2,000 in the bank, and I could manage, I know I could manage, to give you a thousand if... Mrs. Manstey paused. The tears were rolling down her cheeks. There, there, Mrs. Manstey, don't you worry, repeated Mrs. Black soothingly. I am sure we can settle it. I am sorry that I can't stay and talk about it any longer, but this is such a busy time of day with supper to get. Her hand was on the doorknob, but with sudden vigor, Mrs. Manstey seized her wrist. You are not giving me a definite answer. Do you mean to say that you accept my proposition? Why, I'll think it over, Mrs. Manstey. Certainly I will. I wouldn't annoy you for the world. But the work is to begin tomorrow, I am told, Mrs. Manstey persisted. Mrs. Black hesitated. It shan't begin. I promise you that. I'll send word to the builder this very night. Mrs. Manstey tightened her hold. You are not deceiving me, are you? she said. No, no, stammered Mrs. Black. How can you think such a thing of me, Mrs. Manstey? Slowly, Mrs. Manstey's clutch relaxed, and she passed through the open door. One thousand dollars, she repeated, pausing in the hall. Then she let herself out of the house and hobbled down the steps, supporting herself on the cast-iron railing. My goodness exclaimed mrs black shutting and bolting the hall door i never knew the old woman was crazy and she looks so quiet and ladylike too mrs manstey slept well that night but early the next morning she was awakened by a sound of hammering she got to her window with what haste she might and looking out saw that mrs black's yard was full of workmen some were carrying loads of brick from the kitchen to the yard, others beginning to demolish the old-fashioned wooden balcony which adorned each story of Mrs. Black's house. Mrs. Manstey saw that she had been deceived. At first she thought of confiding her trouble to Mrs. Sampson, but a settled discouragement soon took possession of her, and she went back to bed, not caring to see what was going on. Toward afternoon, however, feeling that she must know the worst, she rose and dressed herself. It was a laborious task, for her hands were stiffer than usual, and the hooks and buttons seemed to evade her. When she seated herself in the window, she saw that the workmen had removed the upper part of the balcony, and that the bricks had multiplied since morning. One of the men, a coarse fellow with a bloated face, picked a magnolia blossom, and after smelling it threw it to the ground the next man carrying a load of bricks trod on the flower in passing look out jim called one of the men to another who was smoking a pipe if you throw matches around near those barrels of paper you'll have the old tinder box burning down before you know it and mrs manstey leaning forward perceived that there were several barrels of paper and rubbish under the wooden balcony. At length the work ceased, and twilight fell. The sunset was perfect, and a roseate light, transfiguring the distant spire, lingered late in the west. When it grew dark, Mrs. Manstey drew down the shades and proceeded, in her usual methodical manner, to light her lamp. She always filled and lit it with her own hands keeping a kettle of kerosene on a zinc-covered shelf in a closet. As the lamplight filled the room, it assumed its usual peaceful aspect. The books and pictures and plants seemed, like their mistress, to settle themselves down for another quiet evening, and Mrs. Manstey, as was her wont, drew up her armchair to the table and began to knit. That night she could not sleep. The weather had changed, and a wild wind was abroad, blotting the stars with close-driven clouds. Mrs. Manstey rose once or twice and looked out of the window, but of the view nothing was discernible, save a tardy light or two in the opposite windows. 
these lights at last went out and mrs manstey who had watched for their extinction began to dress herself she was in evident haste for she merely flung a thin dressing gown over her nightdress and wrapped her head in a scarf then she opened her closet and cautiously took out the kettle of kerosene having slipped a bundle of wooden matches into her pocket she proceeded with increasing precautions to unlock her door and a few moments later she was feeling her way down the dark staircase led by a glimmer of gas from the lower hall at length she reached the bottom of the stairs and began the more difficult descent into the utter darkness of the basement here however she could move more freely as there was less danger of being overheard and without much delay she contrived to unlock the iron door leading into the yard a gust of cold wind smote her as she stepped out and groped shiveringly under the clothesline that morning at three o'clock an alarm of fire brought the engines to mrs black's door and also brought mrs sampson's startled boarders to their windows the wooden balcony at the back of mrs black's house was ablaze and among those who watched the progress of the flames was mrs manstey leaning in her thin dressing gown from the open window the fire however was soon put out and the frightened occupants of the house who had fled in scant attire reassembled at dawn to find that little mischief had been done beyond the cracking of window panes and smoking of ceilings in fact the chief sufferer by the fire was mrs manstey who was found in the morning gasping with pneumonia a not unnatural result as everyone remarked of her having hung out of an open window at her age in a dressing gown it was easy to see that she was very ill but no one had guessed how grave the doctor's verdict would be and the faces gathered that evening about mrs sampson's table were awestruck and disturbed not that any of the boarders knew mrs manstey well she kept to herself as they said and seemed to fancy herself too good for them but then it is always disagreeable to have anyone dying in the house and as one lady observed to another it might just as well have been you or me my dear but it was only mrs manstey and she was dying as she had lived lonely if not alone the doctor had sent a trained nurse and mrs sampson with muffled step came in from time to time but both to mrs manstey seemed remote and unsubstantial as the figures in a dream all day she said nothing but when she was asked for her daughter's address she shook her head at times the nurse noticed that she seemed to be listening attentively for some sound which did not come then again she dozed the next morning at daylight she was very low the nurse called mrs sampson and as the two bent over the old woman they saw her lips move lift me up out of bed she whispered they raised her in their arms and with her stiff hand she pointed to the window oh the window she wants to sit in the window she used to sit there all day mrs sampson explained it could do her no harm i suppose nothing matters now said the nurse they carried mrs manstey to the window and placed her in her chair the dawn was abroad a jubilant spring dawn the spire had already caught a golden ray though the magnolia and horse chestnut still slumbered in shadow in mrs black's yard all was quiet the charred timbers of the balcony lay where they had fallen it was evident that since the fire the builders had not returned to their work the magnolia had unfolded a few more sculptural flowers the view was undisturbed it was hard for mrs manstey to breathe each moment it grew more difficult she tried to make them open the window but they would not understand if she could have tasted the air sweet with a penetrating alanthus savor 
it would have eased her. But the view, at least, was there. The spire was golden now. The heavens had warmed from pearl to blue. Day was alight from east to west. Even the magnolia had caught the sun. Mrs. Manstey's head fell back, and smiling, she died. That day, the building of the extension was resumed. End of Section 5, Mrs. Manstey's View by Edith Wharton. Section 6 of 1891 Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. 1891 Collection by Various. Section 6. Americanisms and Britishisms by Brander Matthews In a novel written in the last decade, but one of the 19th century, by an Australian lady, in collaboration with a member of Parliament, one of the characters stops another to ask for the explanation of this or that Australian phrase, wondering whether it would be better to give the English meaning of each word after the word itself, and to keep on repeating it all through, or would it do to put a footnote once for all, or how would it do to have a little glossary at the end? As it happens, oddly enough, the authors of The Ladies Gallery have not themselves done any one of these things, and therefore, if we chance to read their fiction, we are left to grope for ourselves when in the first two chapters we are told of the wild howling of the dingoes in the scrub and when we learn that the hero had eaten his evening meal damper and a hard junk of wallaby flesh while his belly of tea was warming then we are informed that he had arranged a bed with his blankets his swag for a pillow and that he wished for a good mate to share his watch, or even a black tracker upon whom he could depend as a scout. We are told also that this hero, who was not intended to grub along, hears a call in the night, and he reflects that a black fellow would not cooee in that way. Later he cuts up a fig of tobacco. He says, We can yarn now. He speaks of living on wild plums and bandicoot, and he makes mention of a certain newchum. From the context, we may fairly infer that this last term is the Australian equivalent of the Western tenderfoot. But who shall explain the meaning of damper and dingoes, cooee and bandicoot? And why have scrub and billy, grub and fig taken on new meanings, as though they had suffered a sea change? in the long voyage around the Cape or through the canal. As yet, so far as I know, no British critic has raised a cry of alarm against the coming degradation of the English language by the invasion of Australianisms. It can hardly be doubted, however, that the necessities of a new civilization will force the Australian to the making of many a new word to define new conditions. As the San Francisco Hoodlum is different from the New York loafer, so the Melbourne larrikin has differentiated himself from the London rough, and in due season a term had to be developed to denote this differentiation. There are also not a few Canadian phrases to be collected by the curious, and the exiles in India have evolved a vocabulary of their own by frequent adoption of native words which makes difficult the reading of certain of Mr. Rudyard Kipling's earlier tales. To recall these things is but to recognize that the same causes are at work in Canada, in India, and in Australia, as have been acting in the United States. It remains to be seen whether the British critic will show the same intolerance towards the colonial and dependent Australian and Canadian that he has been wont to show towards the independent American. 
the controversy when it comes is one at which the american will look on with disinterested amusement remembering that those laugh best who laugh last and that dean alford omitted from the later editions of his dogmatic discussion of the queen's english a passage which was prominent in the first edition issued in eighteen sixty three during the war of the rebellion and which animadverted on the process of deterioration that the queen's english had undergone at the hands of the americans look at those phrases he cried which so amused us in their speech and books at their reckless exaggeration and contempt for congruity and then compare the character and history of the nation its blunted sense of moral obligation and duty to man its open disregard of conventional right where aggrandizement is to be obtained and i may now say its reckless and fruitless maintenance of the most cruel and unprincipled war in the history of the world time can be relied on to quash an indictment against a nation and we americans should be sorry to think that there are to-day in england any of those who in eighteen sixty three sympathized with the dean of canterbury and who are not now heartily ashamed of their attitude then owing it may be to the consciousness of strength which is a precious result of the war the british clergyman denounced thus eloquently the last tie of colonialism which bound us to the mother country is broken we know now that the mother tongue is a heritage and not a loan it is ours to use as we needs must in america there is no necessity to plead for the right of the americanism to exist the cause is won no american writer worth his salt would think of withdrawing a word or of apologizing for a phrase because it was not current within sound of bow bells the most timid of american authoresses has no doubt as to her use of railroad conductor grade and to switch despite her possible knowledge that in british usage the equivalents of these words are railway guard gradient and to shunt on the contrary in fact there is visible now and again especially on the part of the most highly cultivated writers an obvious delight in grasping an indigenous word racy of the soil there is many an american expression of a pungent freshness which authors weary of an outworn vocabulary seize eagerly it may be a new word but it would not be in accord with our traditions to refuse naturalization to a welcome newcomer or it may be a survival flourishing here in our open fields although long since rooted out of the trim island garden on the other side of the atlantic and in such case we use it unhesitatingly today as our forefathers used it in the past following as lowell remarks the fashion of our ancestors who unhappily could bring over no english better than shakespeare's in the preface to the first edition of his dictionary issued in eighteen twenty five noah webster declared that although in america the body of the language is the same as in england and is desirable to perpetuate that sameness yet some differences must exist since language is the expression of ideas and if the people of one country cannot preserve an identity of ideas with the people of another country they are not likely to retain an absolute identity of language and webster had no difficulty in showing that differences of physical and political conditions had already in his day only half a century after the revolution and when the centre of population was still close to the atlantic seaboard produced differences of speech it is too much to expect perhaps that the british critic shall look at this yankee independence from our point of view Professor Lounsbury tells us in his admirable biography that in Fenimore Cooper's time the attitude of the Englishman towards the American, in the most favorable cases, was supercilious and patronizing, 
an attitude which never permits the nation criticizing to understand the nation criticized. Things have changed for the better since Cooper was almost alone in his stalwart Americanism, but the arrogance which General Braddock of His Majesty's Army showed towards Colonel Washington of the Virginia contingent survives here and there in Great Britain even though another dean sits in Dr. Alford's stall in Canterbury Cathedral. It prompted a British novelist not long ago to be offensively impertinent to an American lady, Athenaeum, September 1st, 1888, and it allowed Lord Wolsey to insult the memory of Robert E. Lee with ignorant praise. It finds expression in a passage like the following from A Primer of English Composition by Mr. John Nichols. Americanisms as Britisher, skedaddle, and the peculiar use of clever, calculate, guess, reckon, etc., with the mongrel speech adopted by some humorists, are only admissible in satirical pictures of American manners. Page 35. When we read an assertion of this sort, we are reduced to believe that it must be the dampness of the British climate which has thus rusted the hinges of British manners. Far more often than we could wish can we hear the note of lofty condescension in British discussion of the peculiarities of other races. When Englishmen are forced to compare themselves with men of any other country, no doubt it must be difficult for them not to plume themselves on their superior virtue. But modesty is also a virtue, and if this were more often cultivated in Great Britain, the French, for example, would have fewer occasions for making pointed remarks about la morgue britannique, even the gentle Thackeray, if the excursus may be forgiven, is not wholly free from this failing. In spite of his familiarity with French life and French art, he could not quite divest himself of his British pride and of the intolerance which accompanies it, and therefore we find him recording that Monsieur de Florac confided gaily to Mr. Clive Newcomb the reason why he preferred the coffee at the hotel to the coffee at the great café with a Doris Argen in Rebus Ejessa, pronounced in the true French manner. Newcombs, chapter 28. But how should a Frenchman pronounce Latin? Like an Englishman, perhaps? When even the kindly Thackeray is capable of a sneering insularity of this sort, it is small wonder that the feeling of the French towards the British is well expressed in the final line of the quatrain inscribed over the gate at Compiègne, through which Joan d'Arc went to her capture. Tout, tout cela de Albion non fait le bien jamais, and we are reminded of the English lady who was taken to see Mr. Jefferson's performance of Rip Van Winkle, and who liked it very much indeed, but thought it such a pity that the actor had so strong an American accent. Ignorance of his neighbor is the character of the typical John Bull says Mr. R. L. Stevenson, who also declares that the Englishman sits apart, bursting with pride and ignorance. What a Scot has written, a Yankee may quote. And the quotation has pertinence here in view of the fact that in the last century the English were just as keen against Scotticisms and Hibernicisms, and just as bitter as they have been in the century against Americanisms, and as they may be in the next against Australianisms. Macaulay asserted that there were in Marmion and in Waverley Scotticisms at which a London apprentice would laugh, and there are to be seen in the English newspapers now and again petty attacks on the style and vocabulary of American authors of distinction which it is perhaps charitable to credit to London apprentices. One of these, it was no doubt, who began a review of Mr. Brownell's subtle and profound study of French traits, with the statement that 
the language most depressing to the educated englishman is the language of the cultured american probably the small sword will always be exasperating to those who cling to the boxing glove when a london apprentice laughs at the scottishisms of the north britain and when the london athenaeum is depressed by the language of cultured americans there is to be discovered behind the laugh and the scoff an assumption that any departure from the usage which obtains in london is most deplorable the laugh and the scoff are the outward and visible signs of an inward and spiritual belief that the londoner is the sole guardian and trustee of the english language but this is a belief for which there is no foundation whatever the english language is not bankrupt that it needs to have a receiver appointed it is quite capable of minding its own business without the care of a committee of englishmen if indeed a guardian were necessary what englishman would it be who would best preserve our pure english the shepherd of dorset or the miner of northumberland the yorkshire man or the cockney if it is not the london apprentice who is to set the standard but the englishman of breeding it is hard to discover the ground whereon this englishman can claim superiority of taste or knowledge over the other educated men to whom english is the mother tongue whether they were born in scotland ireland or america in australia india or canada the fallacy of the englishman be he london apprentice or contributor to the athenaeum is that he erects a merely personal standard in the use of our language he compares the english he finds in the novels of a scotchman or in the essays of an american with that which he hears about him daily in london animadverting upon every divergence from this local british usage as a departure from the strict letter of the law which governs our language it is of course unfair to suggest that a parochial self-satisfaction underlies this utilization of personal experience as the sole test of linguistic propriety but the procedure is amusingly illogical the cockney has no monopoly of good english if even he has his full portion the englishman in england is but the elder brother of the anglo-saxon elsewhere and by no right of primogeniture does he control the language which is our birthright noah webster in the preface from which quotation has already been made remarked that american authors had a tendency to write the language in its genuine idiom and he asserted that in this respect franklin and washington whose language is their hereditary mother tongue unsophisticated by modern grammar present as pure models of genuine english as addison or swift it may be doubted whether english is now more vigorously spoken or better understood in london than in new york or in melbourne but it is indisputable that the student detects in the ordinary speech of the englishman many a lapse from the best usage this contaminating of the well of english undefiled is not to be defended because it is due to englishmen who happen to live in england a blunder made in great britain is to be stigmatized as a britishism and it is to be avoided by those who take thought of their speech just as though the impropriety were a scottishism or a hibernicism an americanism or an australianism when a locution of the london apprentice is not in accord with the principles of the language there is no prejudice in its favour because it happened to arise beside the thames rather than on the shores of the hudson or by the banks of the st lawrence of britishisms there are as many and as worthy of collection and collocation as were the most of the americanisms the all-embracing bartlett gathered into his dictionary indeed if a scot or a yankee were to prepare a glossary of britishisms on the ample scale adopted by mr bartlett 
and with the same generous hospitality, the result would surprise no one more than the Englishman. We should find in its pages many a word and phrase and turn of speech common enough in England, and quite foreign to the best usage of those who speak English. Briticisms, as worthy of reproof as the worst specimen of the Mongol speech adopted by some humorists in America. These are to be sought rather in the written language than in oral speech, though there are criticisms of plenty in the talk of the Londoner, from the suppression of the initial H among the masses to the dropping of the final G among the classes. Of a truth, precision of speech is not frequent in London, and not seldom the delivery of the Englishman of education nowadays may fairly be called slovenly. As I recall the list of those whom I have heard use the English language with mingled ease and elegance, I find fewer Englishmen than either Scotchmen or Americans. Quintilian tells us that an old Athenian woman called the eloquent Theophrastus a stranger, and declared that she had discovered him to be a foreigner, only from his speaking in a manner too attic. Something of this ultra-precision is perhaps to be observed today in the modern Athens, be that Edinburgh or Boston. In the ordinary speech of Englishmen, there are not a few vocables which grate on American ears. Sometimes they are ludicrous, sometimes they are hideous, sometimes they seem to us simply strange. Thus, when Matthew Arnold wrote about Tolstoy, he told us that Anna Karenina throws herself under the wheels of a goods train. To us Americans, this sounds odd, as it is our habit to call the means of self-destruction, chosen by the Russian heroine, a freight train. But it is simply due to the accidental evolution of railroad terminology in England and in America at the same time, whereby the same thing came to be called by a different name on either side of the Atlantic. Neither term has a right of way as against the other, and it would be interesting to foresee which will get down to our great-grandchildren. In like manner, the keyless watch of Great Britain is the stemwinder of the United States, and here, again, there is little to choose, as both words are logical. The use of like for as, not uncommon in the southern states, has there always been regarded as an indefensible colloquialism. But in England it is heard in the conversation of literary men of high standing, and now and again it even gets itself into print in books of good repute. It will be found, for instance, in the sketch of Macaulay, which the late Cotter Morrison wrote for the series of English men of letters edited by Mr. John Morley and Walter Baghall represents the dwellers in the old manor houses and rural parsonages, asking, Why can't they, the French, have kings, lords, and commons, like we have? Here, occasion serves to remark that Baghall's own writing is besprinkled with Briticisms. His style is slouchy beyond belief. It is impossible to imagine a Frenchman or an American capable of thinking as clearly and as cogently as Baghaw, and willing to write as carelessly. To be noted also is the British habit of saying, very pleased, when the tradition of the language and the best American usage alike require one to say, very much pleased. Equally noteworthy is the misuse of without, for unless, condemned in America as a vulgarism, but discoverable in England in the pages of important periodical publications. For example, in the number of the New Review for August 1890, we find Sir Charles Dilt, who, as a member of Her Majesty's Privy Council, ought to be familiar with the Queen's English, writing that nothing can be brought before the vestry without the vestry is duly summoned. Among the political Briticisms which deserve collection, as well as 
political Americanisms, although far less picturesque, are to be recorded the use of the government, when the ministry, rather, is intended, and also the habit of accepting these nouns of multitude as plural, and therefore of writing the ministry are and the government are, where an American would more naturally write the administration is. Another more recent Briticism is the growing habit of dropping the article and saying that ministers are, meaning thereby that the cabinet as a whole is about to take action. As yet, I have not seen ministers is, but even this barbaric locution bids fair to be reached in course of time. It must be admitted that the terminology of politics is independent in its tendencies and frequently breaks the slate of the regular grammar. It was the speech-making of an American senator which appeared to the late George T. Lanigan as a foretaste of that grammatical millennium when the singular verb shall lie down with the plural noun and a little conjunction shall lead them. Perhaps the two most frequent Briticisms and the most obvious are the use of different to, where the American more appropriately and logically says different from, and the employment of directly and its synonym immediately, or as soon as, in such phrases as directly he arrived, he did thus. Even Thackeray, in his most carefully written and most artistic novel, allowed Henry Esmond to write instantly for as soon as, whereby he was guilty also of an anachronism. As this blunder is a Briticism of comparatively recent origin, and is not yet to be found in the pages of any American author of authority, it is perhaps worthy of note that in the triumph of psychological insight barry linden which also is written in the first person we find like for as much as though it were a hibernicism which we do not understand it to be i am informed and believe for in matters of language i prefer to testify on information and belief only and not to make affidavit of my own knowledge necessarily circumscribed by individual experience i am informed and believe that an englishman says lift where we say elevator and that he calls that man an agricultural laborer whom an american would term a farmhand in the one case the briticism is the shorter and in the other the americanism i am told that an englishman calls for a tin of condensed milk when an american would ask for a can and that an Englishman even ventures to taste tinned meat, which we Americans would suspect to be tainted by the metal, although we have no prejudice against canned meats. I understand that an Englishman stops at a hotel at which an American would stay. I have been led to believe that an English woman of fashion will go to a swagger function at which she will expect to meet no end of smart people, meaning thereby not clever folks, but swells. I have heard that an Englishman speaks of a wire, meaning a telegram, and I know that an English friend of mine in New York received a letter from his sister in London, bidding him hold himself in readiness to cross the Atlantic at a day's notice, and informing him that he might have to come over on a wire. To an American, going over the ocean on a wire seems an unusual mode of traveling, and too Blondin-like to be attempted by less expert acrobats. The point halfway between us and our adversary seems nearer to him, but this is an optical delusion, just as the jet of water in the center of a fountain appears closer to the other side than to ours. So it is not easy for anyone on either shore of the Atlantic to be absolutely impartial in considering the speech of those on the other. An American with the 
sense of the poetic cannot but prefer to the imported word autumn the native and more logical word fall which the british have strangely suffered to drop into disuse an american conscious of the fact that cunning is frequent in the mouths of his fair countrywomen and that it is sadly wrenched from its true significance is aware also that the british are trying to cramp our mother tongue by limiting bug to a single offensive species by giving to bloody an ulterior significance as of semi-profanity and by restricting sick to a single form of physical wretchedness forgetful that peter's wife's mother once lay sick of a fever and that an officer in her majesty's service may even now go home on sick leave the ordinary and broader use of sick is not as uncommon in england as some british critics affect to think i have heard an englishman defend the use of i feel bad for i feel ill on the ground that he employed the former phrase only when he was sick enough to be above all thought of grammar we americans have extended the meaning of transom which strictly speaking was the bar across the top of the door under the fanlight itself this american enlargement of the meaning of transom has not found favor at the hands of british critics who did not protest in any way against the british restriction of the meaning of bug bloody and sick indeed in the very number of the london weekly review in which we could read a protest against mr howells employment of transom in its more modern american meaning was to be seen an advertisement of a journalist in want of a job and vaunting himself as an expert in the writing of leaderettes surely leaderette is as unlovely a vocable as one could find in a sabbath day's reading and moreover it is almost unintelligible to an american who calls that an editorial which the englishman calls a leader and who would term that an editorial paragraph which the englishman terms a leaderette another sentence plucked from the pages of the saturday review about the same time is also almost incomprehensible to the ordinary american but he is so brilliant and so much by way of being complete that they will be few who read his book and do not wish to know more of him from the context we may hazard a guess that so much by way of being is here synonymous with almost but what would lindley murray say to so vile a phrase that lindley murray whom the british invoke so often ignoring or ignorant of the fact that he was an american holding with the late richard grant white that ours is really a grammarless tongue and distrusting all efforts of schoolmasters to straitjacket our speech into formulas borrowed from the latin i for one should be quite willing to abandon lindley murray to the british it is not the first time that an american weed has been exhibited in england as a horticultural beauty our common wayside mullein for example is cherished across the atlantic as the american velvet plant other divergencies of usage may perhaps deserve a passing word it is an americanism to call him clever whom we deem good-natured only and it is a briticism to call that entertainment smart which we consider very fashionable and of the two the briticism seems the more natural outgrowth so also the british terminus of latin origin is better than the american depot of french origin it is a wonder that so uncouth an absurdity as depot ever got into use when we had at hand the natural word station sometimes the difference between the americanism and the briticism is very slight in america coal is put on the grate in the singular while in england coals are put in the grate in the plural in the united states beets are served at table as a vegetable while in great britain beet root is served 
Oddly enough, the British do not say potato root or carrot root when they order either of those esculents to be cooked, and as the American usage seems the more logical, perhaps it is more likely to prevail. Sometimes, and indeed one might say often, a word or a usage is denounced by some British critic without due examination of the evidence on its behalf. Professor Freeman, for example, who is frequently finicky in his choice of words, objected strongly to the use of metropolis as descriptive of the chief city of a country, rather restricting the word to its more ecclesiastical significance as a cathedral town. And Mr. Skeet has admitted the validity of the objection. But Mr. R. O. Williams, in his recent suggestive paper on Good English for Americans, informs us that metropolis was employed to indicate the most important city of the state by Macaulay, an author most careful in the use of words, and by De Quincey, a purist of the strictest sect. Nay, more, he even finds metropolis thus taken in the prose of Addison and in the verse of Milton. In like manner, Dr. Fitzedward Hall had no difficulty in showing that reliable, often objugated as an Americanism, is to be found in a letter written in 1624 by one Richard Montague, afterwards a bishop, and that it owes its introduction into literature to Coleridge, who used it in 1800. Dr. Hall has also shown that scientist, which Mr. A. J. Ellis saw fit to denounce as an American barbaric trisyllable, was first used by an Englishman, Dr. Wewell, in 1840. One of the abiding advantages of the New English Dictionary of the Philological Society, an advantage which may more than counterbalance the carelessness with which its quotations have been verified, is that its columns can be used to convince even the ordinary British critic that many a word and many an expression which he is prompt to condemn as an Americanism, and therefore pestilent, is to be found in the literature of our language long before the Declaration of Independence broke the political unity of the Anglo-Saxon race. And although a negative is always difficult of proof, this same New English Dictionary gives evidence in behalf of the late Mr. White's contention that Britisher is not an Americanism, but a Briticism. He said that the word was never heard in the mouth of an American, and, as it happens, Dr. Murray is not able to adduce it in its behalf a single quotation from any American author. The effort for precision, the desire to make a word do more than is set down for it, the wish to have warrant for every syllable, is neither despicable nor futile. It is only by taking thought that language can be bent to do our will. The sparse vocabulary and the rude idioms of the shepherd or the teamster are inadequate to the needs of the poet and of the student. The ideal of style is said to be the speech of the people in the mouth of the scholar. And Walter Backhawk, in his essay on Stern and Thackeray, one of the few of his papers which have art and form as well as sympathy and insight, declares that how language was first invented and made we may not know, but beyond doubt it was shaped and fashioned into its present state by common ordinary men and women, using it for common and ordinary purposes. They wanted a carving knife, not a razor or lancet. And those great artists who have to use language for more exquisite purposes, who employ it to describe changing sentiments and momentary fancies, and the fluctuating and indefinite inner world, must use curious nicety and hidden but effectual artifice, else they cannot duly punctuate their thoughts and slice the fine edges of their reflections. A hair's breadth is as important to them as a yard's breadth to a common workman. To put so sharp a point upon his style, the artist in words must choose his material with unfaltering care. He must select and store away 
in his grip the best words. He must free his vocabulary from clumsy localisms, whether these be Americanisms or Briticisms. He must be true to the inherent and vital principles of our language, not yielding to temporary defections from the truth, whether these flourish in Great Britain or in the United States. It cannot be said too often that there is no basis for the belief that somewhere there exists a sublimated English language, perfect and impeccable. This is the flawless ideal to which all artists in style strive vainly to attain. Whether they are Englishmen or Americans, Australians or Canadians, Irish or Scotch. But nowhere in this speech without stain spoken by man in his daily life not in London, where cockneyisms abound, not in Oxford, where university slang is luxuriant and where pedantry flourishes. Nowhere has this pure and undefiled language ever been spoken by any community. Nowhere will it ever be spoken other than by a few men here and there, gifted by nature or trained by art. The speech of the people in the mouth of the scholar that is the absolute ideal which no man can find by travel and which every man must make for himself by toil avoiding alike the tendency of the people towards slouching inaccuracy and the tendency of the scholar towards academic frigidity of the two the more wholesome leaning is towards the forcible idioms of the plain people rather than the tamer precision of the student the wild flowers of speech plucked betimes with the dew still on them humble and homely and touching such as we find in franklin and in emerson in lowell and in thoreau are to be preferred infinitely before the waxen petals of rhetoric as a schoolmaster arranges them the grammarian the purist the pernickety stickler for trifles is the deadly foe of good english rich in idioms and racy of the soil Every man who has taught himself to know good English, and to love it, and to delight in it, must sympathize with Professor Lounsbury's lack of admiration for that grammar school training which consists in teaching the pupil how much more he knows about our tongue than the great masters who have molded it, which practically sets up the claim that the only men who are able to write English properly are the men who have never shown any capacity to write it at all. As to the English of the future, who knows what the years may bring forth? The language is alive and growing and extending on all sides, to the grief of the purist and the pedant, who prefer a dead language that they can dissect at will, and that has come to the end of its usefulness. The existence of Briticisms and of Americanisms and of Australianisms is a sign of healthy vitality. Neither usage, said Professor Freeman, after contrasting certain Americanisms and Briticisms, can be said to be in itself better or worse than the other. Each usage is the better in the land in which it has grown up of itself. An unprejudiced critic if such a one could happily be found, would probably discover an equality of blemish on either side of the ocean, more precision and pedantry on the one side, and a more daring carelessness on the other. To declare a single standard of speech is impossible, that there will ever be any broad divergence between the English language and American speech, such, for example, as differentiates the Portuguese from the Spanish, is now altogether unlikely. A divergence as wide as this has been impossible since the invention of printing, and it is even less possible since the schoolmaster has been abroad teaching the same ABC in London, New York, Sydney, and Calcutta. Although it has ceased absolutely to be British, the chief literature of North America is still English, and must remain so, just as the chief literature of South America is still Spanish. Señor Juan Valera, declaring this truth in the preface to his delightful Pepita Jimenez, 
reminds us that the literature of Syracuse, of Antioch, and of Alexandria was as much Greek literature as was the literature of Athens. In like manner, we may recall the fact that the Lucan, Seneca, Marshall, and Quintilian were all of them Spaniards by birth. That any one country shall remain or become at once the political, financial, and literary center of the wide series of Anglo-Saxon states, which now encircles the globe, is almost equally unlikely. But we may be sure that that branch of our Anglo-Saxon stock will use the best English, and will perhaps see its standards of speech accepted by the other branches, which is most vigorous physically, mentally, and morally, which has the most intelligence, and which knows its duty best, and does it most fearlessly. End of Section 6 Americanisms and Briticisms by Brander Matthews Section 7 of 1891 Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. 1891 Collection by Various. Section 7. A House of Palm Granites by Oscar Wilde. Letter 1. Speaker. December 5th. 1891. Sir, I have just purchased, at a price that for any other English sixpenny paper I would have considered exorbitant, a copy of The Speaker at one of the charming kiosks that decorate Paris. Institutions, by the way, that I think we should at once introduce into London. The kiosk is a delightful object and when illuminated at night from within as lovely as a fantastic chinese lantern especially when the transparent advertisements are from the clever pencil of monsieur Charest. in london we have merely the ill-clad newsvendor whose voice in spite of the admirable efforts of the royal college of music to make england a really musical nation is always out of tune, and whose rags, badly designed and badly worn, merely emphasize a painful note of uncomely misery, without conveying that impression of picturesqueness, which is the only thing that makes the poverty of others at all bearable. It is not, however, about the establishment of kiosks in London that I wish to write to you, though i am of opinion that it is a thing that the county council should at once take in hand the object of my letter is to correct a statement made in a paragraph of your interesting paper the writer of the paragraph in question states that the decorative designs that make lovely my book a house of pomegranates are by the hand of mr shannon while the delicate dreams that separate and herald each story are by mr ricketts the contrary is the case mr shannon is the drawer of the dreams and mr ricketts is the subtle and fantastic decorator indeed it is to mr ricketts that the entire decorative design of the book is due from the selection of the type and the placing of the ornamentation to the completely beautiful cover that encloses the whole the writer of the paragraph goes on to state that he does not like the cover this is no doubt to be regretted though it is not a matter of much importance as there are only two people in the world whom it is absolutely necessary that the cover should please one is mr ricketts who designed it the other is myself whose book it binds we both admire it immensely the reason however that your critic gives for his failure to gain from the cover any impression of beauty seems to me to show a lack of artistic instinct on his part which i beg you will allow me to try to correct 
He complains that a portion of the design on the left-hand side of the cover reminds him of an Indian club with a house painter's brush on top of it, while a portion of the design on the right-hand side suggests to him the idea of a chimney-pot hat with a sponge in it. Now, I do not for a moment dispute that these are the real impressions your critic received. It is the spectator and the mind of the spectator, as I pointed out in the preface to The Picture of Dorian Gray, that art really mirrors. What I want to indicate is this. The artistic beauty of the cover of my book resides in the delicate tracing, arabesques, and massing of many coral red lines on a ground of white ivory. The color effect culminating in certain high gilt notes and being made still more pleasurable by the overlapping band of moss green cloth that holds the book together what the gilt notes suggest what imitative parallel may be found to them in that chaos that is termed nature is a matter of no importance they may suggest as they do sometimes to me peacocks and pomegranates and splashing fountains of gold water or as they do to your critic sponges and indian clubs and chimney-pot hats such suggestions and evocations have nothing whatsoever to do with the aesthetic quality and value of the design a thing in nature becomes much lovelier if it reminds us of a thing in art but a thing in art gains no real beauty through reminding us of a thing in nature the primary aesthetic impression of a work of art borrows nothing from recognition or resemblance these belong to a later and less perfect stage of apprehension properly speaking they are no part of a real aesthetic impression at all and the constant preoccupation with subject matter that characterizes nearly all our english art criticism is what makes our art criticisms especially as regards literature so sterile so profitless so much beside the mark and of such curiously little account i remain sir your obedient servant oscar wilde Boulevard de Capucine, Paris. Letter number two. Paul Mall Gazette, December eleventh, eighteen 1891. To the editor of the Paul Mall Gazette. Sir, I have just had sent to me from London a copy of the Paul Mall Gazette, containing a review of my book, A House of Pomegranates. The writer of this review makes a certain suggestion, which, which I beg you will allow me to correct at once. He starts by asking an extremely silly question, and that is whether or not I have written this book for the purpose of giving pleasure to the British child. Having expressed grave doubts on this subject, a subject on which I cannot conceive any fairly educated person having any doubts at all, he proceeds, apparently quite seriously, to make the extremely limited vocabulary at the disposal of the British child the standard by which the prose of an artist is to be judged. Now, in building this house of pomegranates, I had about as much intention of pleasing the British child as I had of pleasing the British public. Mamilius is as entirely delightful as Caliban is entirely detestable, but neither the standard of Mamilius nor the standard of Caliban is my standard. No artist recognizes any standard of beauty but that which is suggested by his own temperament. The artist seeks to realize, in a certain material, his immaterial idea of beauty, and thus to transform an idea into an ideal that is the way an artist makes things that is why an artist makes things the artist has no other object in making things does your reviewer imagine that mr shannon for instance whose delicate and lovely illustrations he confesses himself quite unable to see 
draws for the purpose of giving information to the blind? I remain, sir, your obedient servant, Oscar Wilde, Boulevard de Capucines, Paris. End of section 7《Eight of 1891 Collection A New England Nun by Mary E. Wilkins》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. 1891 Collection by Various — Section 8 — A New England Nun by Mary E. Wilkins it was late in the afternoon, and the light was waning. There was a difference in the look of the tree shadows out in the yard. Somewhere in the distance, cows were lowing, and a little bell was tinkling. Now and then, a farm wagon tilted by, and the dust flew. Some blue-shirted laborers with shovels over their shoulders plodded past. Little swarms of flies were dancing up and down before the people's faces in the soft air. There seemed to be a gentle stir arising over everything for the mere sake of subsidence, a very premonition of rest and hush and night. This soft diurnal commotion was over Louisa Ellis also. She had been peacefully sewing at her sitting-room window, all the afternoon. Now she quilted her needle carefully into her work, which she folded precisely and laid in a basket with her thimble and thread and scissors. Louisa Ellis could not remember that ever in her life she had mislaid one of these little feminine appurtenances, which had become, from long use and constant association, a very part of her personality. Louisa tied a green apron round her waist and got out a flat straw hat with a green ribbon. Then she went into the garden with a little blue crockery bowl to pick some currants for her tea. After the currants were picked, she sat on the back door step and stemmed them, collecting the stems carefully in her apron and afterwards throwing them into the hen coop. She looked sharply at the grass beside the step to see if any had fallen there. Louisa was slow and still in her movements. It took her a long time to prepare her tea, but when ready it was set forth with as much grace as if she had been a veritable guest to her own self. The little square table stood exactly in the center of the kitchen, and was covered with a starched linen cloth whose border pattern of flowers glistened. Louisa had a damask napkin on her tea tray, where were arranged a cut glass tumbler full of teaspoons, a silver cream pitcher, a china sugar bowl, and one pink china cup and saucer. Louisa used china every day, something which none of her neighbors did. They whispered about it among themselves. Their daily tables were laid with common crockery, their sets of best china stayed in the parlor closet, and Louisa Ellis was no richer nor better bred than they. Still, she would use the china. She had for her supper a glass dish full of sugared currants, a plate of little cakes, and one of light white biscuits, also a leaf or two of lettuce, which she cut up daintily. Louisa was very fond of lettuce which she raised to perfection in her little garden. She ate quite heartily, though in a delicate, pecking way. It seemed almost surprising that any considerable bulk of the food should vanish. After tea, she filled a plate with nicely baked, thin corn cakes and carried them out into the back yard. Caesar, she called. Caesar, Caesar. There was a little rush, and the clank of a chain, and a large, yellow-and-white dog appeared at the door of his tiny hut, which was half hidden among the tall grasses and flowers. Louisa patted him and gave him the corn cakes. Then she returned to the house and washed the tea things, polishing the china carefully. 
the twilight had deepened. The chorus of the frogs floated in at the open window, wonderfully loud and shrill, and once in a while a long, sharp drone from a tree toad pierced it. Louisa took off her green gingham apron, disclosing a shorter one of pink and white print. She lighted her lamp and sat down again with her sewing. In about half an hour, Joe Daggett came. She heard his heavy step on the walk and rose and took off her pink and white apron. Under that was still another, white linen with a little cambric edging on the bottom. That was Louise's company apron. She never wore it without her calico sewing apron over it unless she had a guest. She had barely folded the pink and white one with methodical haste and laid it in a table drawer when the door opened and Joe Daggett entered. He seemed to fill up the whole room. A little yellow canary that had been asleep in his green cage at the south window woke up and fluttered wildly, beating his little yellow wings against the wires. He always did so when Joe Daggett came into the room. Good evening, said Louisa. She extended her hand with a kind of solemn cordiality. Good evening, Louisa, returned the man in a loud voice. She placed a chair for him, and they sat facing each other, with the table between them. He sat, bolt upright, towing out his heavy feet squarely, glancing with a good-humored uneasiness around the room. She sat gently erect, folding her slender hands in her white linen lap. "'Been a pleasant day,' remarked Daggett. "'Real pleasant,' Louisa assented softly. "'Have you been haying?' she asked, after a little while. "'Yes, I've been haying all day, down in the ten-acre lot. Pretty hot work. It must be. Yes, it's pretty hot work in the sun. Is your mother well today? Yes, mother's pretty well. I suppose Lily Dyer's with her now. Daggett colored. Yes, she's with her, he answered slowly. He was not very young, but there was a boyish look about his large face. Louisa was not quite as old as he. Her face was fairer and smoother, but she gave people the impression of being older. I suppose she's a good deal of help to your mother, she said further. I guess she is. I don't know how mother'd get along without her, said Daggett, with a sort of embarrassed warmth. She looks like a real capable girl. She's pretty looking, too, remarked Louisa. Yes, she is pretty fair-looking. Presently, Daggett began fingering the books on the table. There was a square red autograph album, and a young lady's gift book, which had belonged to Louisa's mother. He took them up, one after the other, and opened them, then laid them down again, the album on the gift book. Louisa kept eyeing them with mild uneasiness, Finally, she rose and changed the position of the books, putting the album underneath. That was the way they had been arranged in the first place. Daggett gave an awkward little laugh. Now, what difference did it make which book was on top? said he. Louisa looked at him with a deprecating smile. I always keep them that way, murmured she. You do beat everything, said Daggett, trying to laugh again. His large face was flushed. He remained about an hour longer, then rose to take leave. Going out, he stumbled over a rug, and, trying to recover himself, hit Louisa's work basket on the table and knocked it on the floor. He looked at Louisa, then at the rolling spools. He tucked himself awkwardly toward them, but she stopped him. Never mind, said she. I'll pick them up after you're gone. She spoke with a mild stiffness. Either she was a little disturbed, or his nervousness affected her, and made her seem constrained in her effort to reassure him. When Joe Daggett was outside, he drew in the sweet evening air with a sigh, and felt much 
as an innocent and perfectly well-intentioned bear might after his exit from a china shop louisa on her part felt much as the kind-hearted long-suffering owner of the china shop might have done after the exit of the bear she tied on the pink then the green apron picked up all the scattered treasures and replaced them in her work basket and straightened the rug then she set the lamp on the floor and began sharply examining the carpet she even rubbed her fingers over it and looked at them he's tracked in a good deal of dust she murmured i thought he must have louisa got a dustpan and brush and swept joe daggett's track carefully if he could have known it it would have increased his perplexity and uneasiness although it would not have disturbed his loyalty in the least he came twice a week to see louisa ellis and every time sitting there in her delicately sweet room he felt as if surrounded by a hedge of lace he was afraid to stir lest he should put a clumsy foot or hand through the fairy web and he had always the consciousness that louisa was watching fearfully lest he should still the lace and louisa commanded perforce his perfect respect and patience and loyalty they were to be married in a month after a singular courtship which had lasted for a matter of fifteen years for fourteen out of the fifteen years the two had not once seen each other and they had seldom exchanged letters joe had been all those years in australia where he had gone to make his fortune and where he had stayed until he made it he would have stayed fifty years if it had taken so long and come home feeble and tottering or never come home at all to marry louisa but the fortune had been made in the fourteen years and he had come home now to marry the woman who had been patiently and unquestioningly waiting for him all that time shortly after they were engaged he had announced to louisa his determination to strike out into new fields and secure a competency before they should be married she had listened and assented with the sweet serenity which never failed her not even when her lover set forth on that long and uncertain journey joe buoyed up as he was by his sturdy determination broke down a little at the last but louisa kissed him with a mild blush and said good-bye it won't be for long poor joe had said huskily but it was for fourteen years in that length of time much had happened louisa's mother and brother had died and she was all alone in the world but greatest happening of all a subtle happening which both were too simple to understand louisa's feet had turned into a path smooth maybe under a calm serene sky but so straight and unswerving that it could only meet a check at her grave and so narrow that there was no room for any one at her side louisa's first emotion when joe daggett came home he had not apprised her of his coming was consternation although she would not admit it to herself and he never dreamed of it fifteen years ago she had been in love with him at least she considered herself to be just at that time gently acquiescing with and falling into the natural drift of girlhood she had seen marriage ahead as a reasonable feature and a probable desirability of life she had listened with calm docility to her mother's views upon the subject her mother was remarkable for her cool sense and sweet even temperament she talked wisely to her daughter when joe daggett presented himself and louisa accepted him with no hesitation he was the first lover she had ever had she had been faithful to him all these years she had never dreamed of the possibility of marrying any one else her life 
especially for the last seven years, had been full of a pleasant peace. She had never felt discontented nor impatient over her lover's absence. Still, she had always looked forward to his return and their marriage as the inevitable conclusion of things. However, she had fallen into a way of placing it so far in the future that it was almost equal to placing it over the boundaries of another life. When Joe came, she had been expecting him, and expecting to be married for fourteen years, but she was as much surprised and taken aback as if she had never thought of it. Joe's consternation came later. He eyed Louisa with an instant confirmation of his old admiration. She had changed but little. She still kept her pretty manner and soft grace, and was, he considered, every whit as attractive as ever. As for himself, his stent was done. He had turned his face away from fortune-seeking, and the old winds of romance whistled as loud and sweet as ever through his ears. All the song which he had been wont to hear in them was Louisa. He had for a long time a loyal belief that he heard it still, but finally it seemed to him that Although the winds sang always that one song, it had another name. But for Louisa, the wind had never more than murmured. Now it had gone down, and everything was still. She listened for a little while with half-wistful attention. Then she turned quietly away and went to work on her wedding clothes. Joe had made some extensive and quite magnificent alterations in his house. It was the old homestead. The newly married couple would live there, for Joe could not desert his mother, who refused to leave her old home. So Louisa must leave hers. Every morning, rising and going about among her neat maidenly possessions, she felt as one looking her last upon the faces of dear friends. It was true that in a measure she could take them with her, but, robbed of their old environments, they would appear in such new guises that they would almost cease to be themselves. Then there were some peculiar features of her happy, solitary life, which she would probably be obliged to relinquish altogether. Sterner tasks than these graceful but half-needless ones would probably devolve upon her. There would be a large house to care for. There would be company to entertain. There would be Joe's rigorous and feeble old mother to wait upon, and it would be contrary to all thrifty village traditions for her to keep more than one servant. Louisa had a little still, and she used to occupy herself pleasantly in summer weather with distilling the sweet and aromatic essences from roses and peppermint and spearmint. By and by, her still must be laid away. Her store of essences was already considerable, and there would be no time for her to distill for the mere pleasure of it. Then Joe's mother would think it foolishness. She had already hinted her opinion in the matter. Louisa dearly loved to sew a linen seam, not always for use, but for the simple, mild pleasure which she took in it. She would have been loath to confess how more than once she had ripped a seam for the mere delight of sewing it together again. Sitting at her window during long, sweet afternoons, drawing her needle gently through the dainty fabric, she was peace itself. But there was small chance of such foolish comfort in the future. Joe's mother, domineering, shrewd old matron that she was, even in her old age, and very likely even Joe himself, with his honest masculine rudeness, would laugh and frown down all these pretty but senseless old maiden ways. Louisa had almost the enthusiasm of an artist over the mere order and cleanliness of her solitary home. She had throbs of genuine triumph at the sight of the window panes, which she had polished until they shone like jewels. She gloated gently over her orderly 
bureau drawers, with their exquisitely folded contents redolent with lavender and sweet clover and very purity. Could she be sure of the endurance of even this? She had visions so startling that she half repudiated them as indelicate, of coarse masculine belongings strewn about in endless litter, of dust and disorder arising necessarily from a coarse masculine presence in the midst of all this delicate harmony. Among her forebodings of disturbance, not the least was with regard to Caesar. Caesar was a veritable hermit of a dog. For the greater part of his life he had dwelt in his secluded hut, shut out from the society of his kind and all innocent canine joys. Never had Caesar, since his early youth, watched at a woodchuck's hole. Never had he known the delights of a stray bone at a neighbor's kitchen door. And it was all on account of a sin committed when hardly out of his puppyhood. No one knew the possible depth of remorse of which this mild-visaged, altogether innocent-looking old dog might be capable. But whether or not he had encountered remorse, he had encountered a full measure of righteous retribution. Old Caesar seldom lifted up his voice in a growl or a bark. He was fat and sleepy. There were yellow rings which looked like spectacles around his dim old eyes. But there was a neighbor who bore on his hand the imprint of several of Caesar's sharp, white, youthful teeth, and for that he had lived at the end of a chain all alone in a little hut for fourteen years. The neighbor, who was choleric and smarting with the pain of his wound, had demanded either Caesar's death or complete ostracism. So Louisa's brother, to whom the dog had belonged, had built him his little kennel and tied him up. It was now fourteen years since. In a flood of youthful spirits, he had inflicted that memorable bite and with the exception of short excursions, always at the end of the chain, under the strict guardianship of his master or Louisa, the old dog had remained a close prisoner. It is doubtful if, with his limited ambition, he took much pride in the fact, but it is certain that he was possessed of considerable cheap fame. He was regarded by all the children in the village, and by many adults, as a very monster of ferocity. St. George's dragon could hardly have surpassed in evil repute Louisa Ellis's old yellow dog. Mothers charged their children with solemn emphasis not to go too near to him, and the children listened and believed greedily, with a fascinated appetite for terror, and ran by Louisa's house stealthily, with many sidelong and backward glances at the terrible dog. If, perchance, he sounded a hoarse bark, there was a panic. Wayfarers, chancing into Louisa's yard, eyed him with respect, and inquired if the chain were stout. Caesar at large might have seemed a very ordinary dog, and excited no comment whatever. Chained, his reputation overshadowed him, so that he lost his own proper outlines and looked darkly vague and enormous. Joe Daggett, however, with his good-humoured sense and shrewdness, saw him as he was. He strode valiantly up to him and patted him on the head. In spite of Louise's soft clamour of warning, and even attempted to set him loose, Louisa grew so alarmed that he desisted, but kept announcing his opinion in the matter quite forcibly at intervals. There ain't a better-natured dog in town he would say, and it's downright cruel to keep him tied up there. Some day I'm going to take him out. Louisa had very little hope that he would not, one of these days, when their interests and possessions should be more completely fused in one. She pictured to herself Caesar on the rampage through the quiet and unguarded village. She saw innocent children bleeding in his path. She was herself very fond of the old dog, because he had belonged to her dead brother, and he was always very gentle with her. Still, she had 
great faith in his ferocity. She always warned people not to go too near him. She fed him on ascetic fare of corn mush and cakes, and never fired his dangerous temper with heating and sanguinary diet of flesh and bones. Louisa looked at the old dog munching his simple fare, and thought of her approaching marriage, and trembled. Still, no anticipation of disorder and confusion in lieu of sweet peace and harmony, no forebodings of Caesar on the rampage, no wild fluttering of her little yellow canary were sufficient to turn her a hair's breadth. Joe Dackett had been fond of her and working for her all these years. It was not for her, whatever came to pass, to prove untrue and break his heart. She put the exquisite little stitches into her wedding garments, and the time went on until it was only a week before her wedding day. It was a Tuesday evening, and the wedding was to be a week from Wednesday. There was a full moon that night. About nine o'clock, Louisa strolled down the road a little way. There were harvest fields on either hand, bordered by low stone walls. Luxuriant clumps of bushes grew beside the wall, and trees, wild cherry and old apple trees, at intervals. Presently, Louisa sat down on the wall and looked about her with mildly sorrowful reflectiveness. Tall shrubs of blueberry and meadowsweet, all woven together and tangled with blackberry vines and horsebriars, shut her in on either side. She had a little clear space between them. Opposite her, on the other side of the road, was a spreading tree. The moon shone between its boughs, and the leaves twinkled like silver. The road was bespread with a beautiful, shifting dapple of silver and shadow. The air was full of a mysterious sweetness. "'I wonder if it's wild grapes,' murmured Louisa. She sat there some time. She was just thinking of rising when she heard footsteps and low voices and remained quiet. It was a lonely place, and she felt a little timid. She thought she would keep still in the shadow and let the persons, whoever they might be, pass her. But just before they reached her, the voices ceased, and the footsteps. She understood that their owners had also found seats upon the stone wall. She was wondering if she could not steal away unobserved. When the voice broke the stillness, it was Joe Daggett's. She sat still and listened. The voice was announced by a loud sigh, which was as familiar as itself. Well, said Daggett, you've made up your mind then, I suppose. Yes, returned another voice. I'm going day after tomorrow. That's Lily Dyer, thought Louisa to herself. The voice embodied itself in her mind. She saw a girl, tall and full-figured, with a firm, fair face, looking fairer and firmer in the moonlight, her strong yellow hair braided in a close knot, a girl full of a calm, rustic strength and bloom, with a masterful way which might have beseemed a princess. Lily Dyer was a favorite with the village folk. She had just the qualities to arouse the admiration. She was good and handsome and smart. Louisa had often heard her praises sounded. Well, said Joe Daggett, I ain't got a word to say. I don't know what you could say, returned Lily Dyer. Not a word to say, repeated Joe drawing out the words heavily. Then there was a silence. I ain't sorry, he began at last. That that happened yesterday, that we kind of let on how we felt to each other. I guess it's just as well we knew. Of course, I can't do anything different. I'm going right on and get married next week. I ain't going back on a woman that's waited for me fourteen years and break her heart. If you should jilt her tomorrow, I wouldn't have you, spoke up the girl with sudden vehemence. Well, I ain't going to give you the chance, said he, but I don't believe you would, either. You'd see I wouldn't. 
honor's honor and right's right and i'd never think anything of any man that went against them for me or any other girl you'd find that out joe daggett well you'll find out fast enough that i ain't going against em for you or any other girl returned he their voices sounded almost as if they were angry with each other louisa was listening eagerly i'm sorry you feel as if you must go away said joe but i don't know but it's best of course it's best i hope you and i have got common sense well i suppose you're right suddenly joe's voice got an undertone of tenderness say lily said he i'll get along well enough myself but i can't bear to think you don't suppose you're going to fret much over it i guess you'll find out i shan't fret much over a married man well i hope you won't i hope you won't lily god knows i do and i hope one of these days you'll come across somebody else i don't see any reason why i shouldn't suddenly her tone changed she spoke in a sweet clear voice so loud she could have been heard across the street no joe daggett said she i'll never marry any other man as long as i live i've got good sense and i ain't going to break my heart nor make a fool of myself but i'm never going to be married you can be sure of that i ain't that sort of a girl to feel this way twice louisa heard an exclamation and a soft commotion behind the bushes then lily spoke again the voice sounded as if she had risen this must be put a stop to said she we've stayed here long enough i'm going home louisa sat there in a daze listening to their retreating steps after a while she got up and slunk softly home herself the next day she did her housework methodically that was as much a matter of course as breathing but she did not sew on her wedding clothes she sat at her window and meditated in the evening joe came louisa ellis had never known that she had any diplomacy in her but when she came to look for it that night she found it although meek of its kind among her little feminine weapons even now she could hardly believe that she had heard aright and that she would not do joe a terrible injury should she break her troth plight she wanted to sound him without betraying too soon her own inclinations in the matter she did it successfully and they finally came to an understanding but it was a difficult thing for he was afraid of betraying himself as she she never mentioned lily dyer she simply said that while she had no cause of complaint against him she had lived so long in one way that she shrank from making a change well i never shrank louisa said daggett i'm going to be honest enough to say that i think maybe it's better this way but if you'd wanted to keep on i'd have stuck to you till my dying day i hope you know that yes i do said she that night she and joe parted more tenderly than they had done for a long time standing in the door holding each other's hands a last great wave of regretful memory swept over them well this ain't the way we've thought it was all going to end is it louisa said joe she shook her head there was a little quiver on her placid face you let me know if there's ever anything i can do for you said he i ain't ever going to forget you louisa then he kissed her and went down the path louisa all alone by herself that night wept a little she hardly knew why but the next morning on waking she felt like a queen who after fearing lest her domain be wrested away from her sees it firmly insured in her possession 
Now the tall weeds and grasses might cluster around Caesar's little hermit hut. The snow might fall on its roof year in and year out, but he never would go on a rampage through the unguarded village. Now the little canary might turn itself into a peaceful yellow ball, night after night, and have no need to wake and flutter with wild terror against its bars. Louisa could sew linen seams, and distill roses, and dust, and polish, and fold away in lavender as long as she liked. That afternoon she sat with her needlework at the window, and felt fairly steeped in peace. Lily Dyer, tall and erect and blooming, went past, but she felt no qualm. If Louisa Ellis had sold her birthright, she did not know it. The taste of the pottage was so delicious, and had been her sole satisfaction for so long. Serenity and placid narrowness had become to her as the birthright itself. She gazed ahead through a long reach of future days, strung together like pearls in a rosary, every one like the others, and all smooth and flawless and innocent, and her heart went up in thankfulness. Outside was the fervid summer afternoon. The air was filled with the sounds of the busy harvest of men and birds and bees. There were hallows, metallic clatterings, sweet calls, and long hummings. Louisa sat, prayerfully numbering her days, like an uncloistered nun. End of section 8 A New England Nun by Mary E. Wilkins Section 9 of 1891 Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Perard. 1891 Collection by Various. Section 9. From Athens to Thebes. The Passes of Parnas and of Kithron Eleuthera. By J.P. Mahaffey from Rambles and Studies in Greece. No ordinary student, looking at the map of Attica and Boeotia, can realize the profound and complete separation between these two countries, except at the very northern extremity where the fortified town of Aropus guarded an easy boundary. All the frontier consists not merely of steep mountains, but of parallel and intersecting ridges and gorges, which contain, indeed, a few alpine valleys, such as that of Eno, but which are, as a rule, wild and barren, easily defensible by a few against many, and totally unfit for the sight of any considerable town or any advanced culture. As I before stated, the traveller can pass through by Decelea, or he can pass most directly by Philae, the fort which Thrasybulus seized when he desired to reconquer Athens with his democratic exiles. The historians usually tell us that he seized and fortified Philae, a statement which the present aspect of it seems to render very doubtful indeed. It is quite impossible that the great hill fort of the very finest attic building, which is still remaining and admired by all, could have been knocked up by Thrasybulus and his exiles. The careful construction and the enormous extent of the building compel us to suppose it the work of a rich state and of a deliberate plan of fortification. It seems very unlikely, for these reasons, that it was built after the days of Thrasybulus, or that so important a point of attack should have been left unguarded in the greater days of Athens. I am therefore convinced that the fort being built long before, and being in fact one of the well-known fortified deems through Attica, had been to some extent dismantled, or allowed to fall into decay, at the end of the Peloponnesian War. This is one of the numerous instances in which a single glance at the locality sets right an historical statement, 
that has eluded suspicion for ages the fort of Philae, like that of eleutherae of which i shall speak and like those of messene and of orchomenus is built of square blocks of stone carefully cut and laid together without a particle of rubble or cement but so well fitted as to be able to resist the wear of ages better than almost any other building i was informed by monsieur emile burnoff that in the case of a fort at megara which i did not see there are even polygonal blocks of which the irregular and varying angles are fitted with such precision that it is difficult as in the case of the parthenon to detect the joinings of the stones the blocks are by no means so colossal in these buildings as in the great ruins about mycenae but the fitting is closer and the sites on which we found them very lofty and with precipitous ascents this style of building is specially mentioned by Thucydides, as being employed in the building of the walls of the Piraeus in the days of Themistocles. Apparently in contrast to the rude and hurried construction of the city walls, but he speaks of the great stones being not only cut square, but fastened with clamps of iron soldered with lead. I am not aware that any traces of this are found in the remaining hill forts. The walls of Piraeus have, unfortunately, long since almost totally disappeared the way from athens to philae leads northwest through the rich fields of the old deme of acarnae and we wonder at first why they should be so noted as charcoal burners but as we approach mount parnas we find that the valley is bounded by tracts of hillside fit for nothing but pine forest a vast deal of wooding still remains it is clear that these forests were the largest and most convenient to supply athens with firewood or charcoal as usual there are many glens and river courses through the rugged country through which we ascend here and there a village in one secluded nook a little monastery hidden from the world if not from its cares there is the usual greek vegetation beside the path not perhaps luxuriant to our northern eyes but full of colors of its own the glowing anemone the blood-red poppy the delicate cistus on a rocky surface with foliage rather gray and silvery than green the pine trees sound as the breeze sweeps up the valleys and lavish their vigorous fragrance through the air there is something inexpressibly bracing in this solitude if solitude it can be called where the forest speaks to the eye and the ear and fills the imagination with the mystery of its myriad forms now and then too the peculiar cadence of those bells which hardly varies throughout all the lands of the south tells you that a flock of goats or goat-like sheep is near attended by solemn silent children whose eyes seem to have no expression beyond that of vague wonder in their gaze these are the flocks of some village below not those of the nomad vlachs who bring with them their tents and dogs and make gypsy encampments in the unoccupied country at last we see high over us the giant fort of philae set upon a natural precipice which defends it amply for half its circuit the point of occupation was well chosen for while within sight of athens and near enough to afford a sure refuge to those who could escape by night and fly to the mountain its distance some fifteen miles and the steep and rugged ascent made it impossible for weak and aged people to crowd into it and mar the efficiency of its garrison with the increase of his force thrasybulus began successful raids into the plain then a rapid movement to Perez. Ultimately, as may be read in all histories, he accomplished the liberation of his native city. We did not pass into Boeotia by the way of Philae, preferring to take the longer route through Eleusis. But no sooner had we left Eleusis than we began to ascend into the rough country, which is the preface to the wild mountain passes of Cithron. 
It is, indeed, very difficult to find where one range of mountains begins and another ends anywhere throughout Greece. There is generally one high peak, which marks a whole chain or system of mountains, and after which the system is called. But all closer specification seems lost on account of the immense number of ridges and points which crowd upon the view in all directions. Thus the chain of Parnix, after throwing out a spur toward the south, which divides the Athenian and Graecian plains, sweeps round the latter in a sort of amphitheater, and joins the system of Cithron, which extends almost parallel with Parnix. A simple look at a good map explains these things by supplementing mere description. The only thing which must be specially enforced is that all the region where a plain is not expressly named is made up of broken mountain ridges and rocky defiles, so that it may fairly be called an alpine country. A fellow traveler who had just been in Norway was perpetually struck with its resemblance to the Norwegian highlands. I will only mention one other fact which illustrates the consequent isolation. We have a river, Cephissus, in the plain of Athens. As soon as we cross the path of Daphne, we have another Cephissus in the Thriasian plain. Within a day's journey, or nearly so, we have another Cephissus, losing itself in the lake Cope, not far from Orchomenus. This repetition of the same name shows how little intercourse people have in the country, how little they travel, and how there is no danger of confusing these identical names. Such a fact, trifling as it is, illustrates very powerfully the isolation which the Greek mountains produce. There is a good road from Athens to Thebes, a very unusual thing in Greece, and we were able to drive with four horses after a fashion which would have seemed very splendid in old days. But strange to say, the old Greek fashion of driving four horses abreast, two being yoked to the pole, and two outriggers, or unintelligible Greek, as they were called, has disappeared from Greece whereas it still survives in southern Italy. On the other hand, the Greeks are more daring drivers than the Italians, being indeed braver in all respects, and when a road is to be had, a very fast pace is generally kept up. As usual, the country was covered with brushwood, and with numbers of old gnarled fir trees, which bore everywhere upon their stems the great wounds of the hatchet, made to extract the resin for the flavoring of wine. Rare flocks of goats, with their peculiar, dull, tinkling bells, bells which have the same make and tone all through Calabria, through Sicily, and through Greece, were the only sign of human occupation or of population. But when you look for houses, there is nothing in the shape of wall or roof save an occasional station where but a few years since soldiers were living to keep the road safe from bandits at last we came upon the camp of some flocks shepherds a thing reminding one far more of a gypsy camp than anything else a few dark brown skins falling over two upright poles so as to form a roof-shaped tent of which the entrance looked so absolutely black as to form quite a patch in the landscape. There is mere room for lying in these tents by night, and, I suppose, in the summer weather most of these wild shepherds will not condescend even to this shelter. After some hours' drive we reached a grassy dell, shaded by large plane trees, where a lonely little public house, if I may so call it, of this construction invited us to stop for watering the horses and inspecting more closely the owner there was the usual supply of such places red and white wine in small casks excellent fresh water and lucumia or turkish delight not only had the owner his belt full of knives and pistols 
but there was hanging up in a sort of rack a most picturesque collection of swords and guns all made in turkish fashion with ornamented handles and stocks and looking as if they might be more dangerous to the sportsman than to his game while we were being served by this wild-looking man in this suspicious place in fact it looked like the daily resort of bandits his wife a comely young woman dressed in the usual dull blue red and white disappeared through the back way and hid herself among the trees this fear of being seen by strangers no doubt caused by jealousy among men and possibly by an oriental tone in the country is a striking feature through most parts of greece it is said to be a remnant of the turkish influence but seems to me to lie deeper and to be even an echo of the old greek days the same feeling is prevalent in most parts of sicily in the towns there you seldom see ladies in the streets and in the evenings except when the playgoing public is returning from the theatre there are only men visible after leaving this resting place about eleven in the morning we did not meet a village or even a single house till we had crossed Kithron after six in the evening and descried the modern hamlet of platea on the slopes to our left but once or twice through the day a string of four or five mules with bright richly striped rugs over their wooden saddles and men dressed still more brightly sitting lady fashion on them were threading their way along the winding road the tinkling of the mules bells and the wild turkish chants of the men were a welcome break in the uniform stillness of the journey the way becomes gradually wilder and steeper though often descending to cross a shady valley which opens to the right and left in a long narrow vista and shows blue far-off hills of other mountain chains one of these valleys was pointed out to us as eno an outlying deem of attica fortified in periclean days and which the peloponnesian army attacked as thucydides tells us and failed to take on their invasion of attica at the opening of the war there are two or three strong square towers in this valley close to the road but not the least like any old greek fort and quite incapable of holding any garrison the site is utterly unsuitable and there seemed no remains of any walled town these facts lead me to reflect upon the narrative of thucydides who evidently speaks of eno as the border fort of attica and yet says not a word about eleuthera which is really the border the great fort and the key to the passes of Kithron. the first solution which suggests itself is that the modern greeks have given the wrong names to these places and that by eno thucydides really means the place now known as Eleuthera. Most decidedly, if the fort which is now there existed at the opening of the Peloponnesian War, he cannot possibly have overlooked it in his military history of the campaign. And yet it seems certain that we must place the building of this fort at the epoch of Athens' greatness, when Attic influence was paramount in Boeotia, and when the Athenians could, at their leisure, and without hindrance construct this fort which commands the passes into attica before they diverge into various valleys about the region of the so-called eno for starting from thebes the slope of Kithron is a single unbroken ascent up to the ridge through which nearly over the village of platea there is a cut that naturally indicates the pass but when the traveller has ascended from Thebes to this point, he finds a steep descent into a mountainous and broken region, where he must presently choose between a gorge to the right or to the left, and must wander about zigzag among mountains, so as to find his way towards Athens. And although I did not examine all the passes accurately, it was perfectly obvious that, as soon as the first defile was left behind, an invader could find various ways of eluding the defenders of Attica and penetrating into the Thriassian plain, or by Philae into that of Athens. Accordingly, the Athenians choose a position of remarkable strength. 
just inside the last crowning ascent, where all the ways converged to pass the crest of the mountain into Platea. Here, a huge rock, interposing between the mountains on each side, strives, as it were, to bar the path, which accordingly divides like a torrent bed and passes on either side, close under the walls of the fort, which occupies the top of the rock. From this point, the summit of the pass is about two or three miles distant and easily visible, so that an outpost there, commanding a view of the whole Theban plain, could signal any approach to the fort with ample notice. The position of the fort of Philae, above described, is very similar. It lies within a mile of the top of the pass, on the Attic side, within sight of Athens and yet near enough to receive the scouts from the top, and resist all sudden attack. No force could invade Attica without leaving a large force to besiege it. Looking backward into Attica, the whole mountainous track of Eno is visible, and though we cannot now tell the points actually selected, there is no difficulty in finding several which could easily pass the signal from Eleuthera to Daphne, and thence to Athens. We know that fire signals were commonly used among the Greeks, and we can here see an instance where news could be telegraphed to some thirty miles over a very difficult country in a few moments. Meanwhile, as succors might be some time in arriving, the fort was of such size and strength as to hold a large garrison and stop any army which could not afford to mask it by leaving there a considerable force. The site was, of course, an old one, and the name Eleuthera, if correctly applied to this fort, points to a time when some mountain tribe maintained its independence here against the governments on either side of the plain, whence the place was called the Free Place, or Liberties, as we have the term in Dublin. There is further evidence of this in a small irregular fort which was erected almost in the center of the larger and later enclosure. This older fort is of polygonal masonry, very inferior to the other, and has fallen into ruins, while the later walls and towers are in many places perfect. The outer wall follows the nature of the position the principal being to find everywhere an abrupt descent from the fortification, so that an assault must be very difficult. On the north side, where the rock is precipitous, the wall runs along in a right line, whereas on the south side, over the modern road, it dips down the hill and makes a semicircular sweep, so as to crown the steepest part of a gentler ascent. Thus, the whole enclosure is of a half-moon shape. But while the straight wall is almost intact, the curved side has, in many places, fallen to pieces. The building is the most perfect I have ever seen of the kind, made of square-hewn stones, evidently quarried on the rock itself. The preserved wall is about two hundred yards long, six and a half feet wide, and apparently not more than ten or twelve feet high, but at intervals of twenty-five or thirty yards there are seven towers, twice as deep as the wall, while the path along the battlement goes right through them. Each tower has a doorway on the outside of it, and close beside this there is also a doorway in the wall, somewhat larger. These doorways, made by a huge lintel, about seven and a half feet long, laid over an aperture in the building, with its edges very smoothly and carefully cut, are for the most part absolutely perfect. As I could see no sign of doorposts or bolts, a feature still noticeable in all temple gates, it is evident that wooden doors and doorposts were fitted into these doorways, a dangerous form of defense, were not the entrances strongly protected by the towers close beside them and over them. There were staircases, leading from the top of the wall outward, beside some of the towers. The whole fort is of such a size as to hold not merely a garrison, but also the flocks and herds of the neighboring shepherds, in case of a sudden and dangerous invasion, and this, no doubt, 
was the primary intention of all the older forts in Greece and elsewhere. The day was, as usual, very hot and fine, and the hills were of that beautiful purple blue which Sir F. Leighton so well reproduces in the backgrounds of his Greek pictures. But a soft breeze brought occasional clouds across the sun, and varied the landscape with deeper hues. Above us, on each side, were the noble crags of Kitheron, with their grey rocks and their gnarled fir trees. Far below, a bright mountain stream was rushing beside the pass into Attica. Around us were the great walls of the old Greeks, laid together with that symmetry, that beauty, and that strength which marks all their work. The massive towers are now defending a barren rock, the enclosure which had seen so many days of war and rapine, was lying open and deserted. The whole population was gone long centuries ago. There is still liberty there, and there is peace, but the liberty and the peace of solitude. A short drive from Eleuthera brought us to the top of the pass, and we suddenly came upon one of those views in Greece which, when we think of them, leave us in doubt whether the instruction they give us or the delight is the greater. The whole plain of Thebes, and, beyond the intervening ridge, the plain of Orchomenus, with its shining lake, were spread out before us. The sites of all the famous towns were easily recognizable. Plataea only was straight beneath us, on the slopes of the mountain, and is yet hidden by them. The plan of all Boeotia unfolded itself with great distinctness. Two considerable plains, separated by a low ridge, and surrounded on all sides by chains of mountains. On the north there are the rocky hills which hem in Lake Copes from the Euboean Strait, and which nature had pierced before the days of history, aided by Minyan engineers, whose unintelligible Greek, as they were called, were tunneled drains, which drew water from thousands of acres of the richest land. On the east, where we stood, was the gloomy Kitheron, the home of awful mythical crimes, and of wild bacchanalian orgies, the theme of many a splendid poem and many a striking tragedy. To the south lay the pointed peaks of Helicon, a mountain, or mountain chain, full of sweetness and light, with many silver streams coursing down its sides, to water the Boeotian plains, and with its dells the home of the muses ever since they inspired the bard of Ascra, the home, too, of Eros, who, long after the reality of the faith had decayed, was honored in Thespia by the crowds of visitors who went up to see the famous statue of the god by Praxiteles. This Helicon separates Boeotia from the southern sea, but does not close up completely with Cithaeron, leaving way for an army coming from the Isthmus, where Leuctra stood to guard the entrance. Over against us, on the west, lay, piled against one another, the dark wild mountains of Phocis, with the giant Parnassus raising its snowy clad shoulders above the rest. But in the far distance, the snowy Corax of Aetolia stood out in rivalry and showed us that Parnassus is but the advanced guard of the wild alpine country, which even in Greece proved too rugged a nurse for culture. We made our descent at full gallop down the windings of the road, a most risky drive, but the coachman was daring and impatient, and we felt, in spite of the danger, that peculiar delight which accompanies the excitement of going at headlong pace. We had previously an even more perilous experience in coming down the steep and tortuous descent from the Lorium mines to Ergasteria in the train, where the sharp turns were apparently full of serious risk. Above our heads were wheeling great vultures, huge birds, almost black, with lean, featherless heads, which added to the wildness of the scene. After this rapid journey, we came upon the site of Plataea, marked by a modern village of the name, on our left, and below us we saw the winding Asopus, 
and the great scene of one of the most famous of all greek battles the battle of plataea this little town is situated much higher up the mountain than i had thought and a glance showed up its invaluable position as an outpost of athenian power toward boeotia with the top of the pass within an hour's walk the plaeacians could from their streets see every movement over the theban plain they could see an invasion from the south coming up by leuctra they could see troops marching northward toward tanagra and inophyta they could even see into the theban cadmia which lay far below them and then telegraph from the top of the pass to eleuthera and from thence to athens we can therefore understand at once Plataea's importance to athens and why the athenians built a strong fortified post on their very frontier within easy reach of it all the site of the great battle is well marked and well known the fountain gargaphia the so-called island and the asopus flowing lazily in a deep cutting sedgy channel in most places far too deep to ford over our heads were still circling the great black vultures but as we neared the plain we flashed a large black and white eagle which we had not seen in attica there is some cultivation between Plataea and Thebes, but strangely alternating with wilderness. We were told that the people have plenty of spare land, and, not caring to labor for its artificial improvement, till a piece of ground once, and then let it lie fallow for a season or two. The natural richness of the Boeotian soil thus supplies them with ample crops. But we wondered to think how impossible it seems even in these rich and favored plains to induce a fuller population the question of the depopulation of greece is no new one it is not due to the slav inroads it is not due to turkish misrule as soon as the political liberties of greece vanished so that the national talent found no scope in local government as soon as the riches of asia were open to greek enterprises the population diminished with wonderful rapidity all the later greek historians and travellers are agreed about the fact the whole of greece could not put in the field says one as many soldiers as came of old from a single city of all the famous cities in Boeotia, says another, but two, Thespia and Tanagra, now remain. The rest are mostly described as ruins. No doubt, every young, enterprising fellow went off to Asia as a soldier or a merchant, and this taste for emigrating has remained strong in the race till the present day, when most of the business of Constantinople, of Smyrna, of alexandria is in the hands of greeks but in addition to this the race itself seems at a certain period to have become less prolific and this too is a remarkable feature lasting to our own time in the several hospitable houses in which i was entertained through the country i sought in vain for children the young married ladies had their mothers to keep them company, and this was a common habit. The daughter does not willingly separate from her mother. But, whether by curious coincidence or not, the absence of children in these seven or eight houses was very remarkable. I have been since assured that this was an accident, and that large families are very common in Greece. The statistics show a considerable increase of population of late years. The evening saw us entering into Thebes, the town which, beyond all others, retains the smallest vestiges of antiquity. Even the site of the Cadmia is not easily distinguishable. Two or three hillocks in and about the town are all equally insignificant and all equally suitable, one should think, for a fortress. The discovery of the old foundations of the walls has, however, determined the matter, and settled the site to be that of the highest part 
of the present town. Its strength, which was celebrated, must have been due nearly altogether to artificial fortification, for though the old city was in a deeper valley to the northwest, yet from the other side there can never have been any ascent steep enough to be a natural rampart. The old city was, no doubt, always more renowned for eating and drinking than for art or architecture, and its momentary supremacy under Epaminondas was too busy and too short a season to be employed in such pursuits. But besides all this, and besides all the ruin of Alexander's fury, the place has been visited several times with the most destructive earthquakes, from the last of which, in 1852, it had not recovered when I first saw it. There were still through the streets houses torn open and walls shaken down. There were gaps made by ruins and half-restored shops. The Antiquities of Thebes consists of a few inscribed slabs and fragments which are, as usual, collected in a dark outhouse, where it is not easy to make them out. I was not at the trouble of reading these inscriptions, for in this department the antiquarians of the University of Athens are really very zealous and competent, and I doubt whether any inscriptions now discovered fails to come into the Greek papers within a few months. From these they of course pass into the Corpus Inscriptionum Gracarum, a collection daily increasing and periodically re-edited. I may observe that, not only for manners and customs, but even for history, these undeniable and seldom suspicious sources are rapidly becoming our surest and even fullest authority. In the opinion of the inhabitants, by far the most important thing about the town is the tomb of their evangelist, St. Luke, which is situated in a chapel close by. The stone is polished and worn with the feet and lips of pilgrims, and all such homes of long devotion are in themselves interesting. But the visitor may well wonder that the evangelist should have his tomb established in a place so absolutely decayed and depopulated as was the region of Thebes, even in his day. The tombs of the early preachers and missionaries are more likely to be in the thickest of thoroughfares amid the noise and strife of men. The evangelist was confused with a later local saint of the same name. Thebes is remarkable for its excellent supply of water. Apart from the fountain dirt, several other great springs rise in the higher ground close to it, and are led by old Greek conduits of marble to the town. One of these springs was large enough to allow us to bathe, a most refreshing change after the long and hot carriage ride, especially in the ice-cold water, as it came from its deep hiding place. We returned at eight in the evening to dine with our excellent host, a host provided for us by telegraph from Athens where we had ample opportunity of noticing some of the peculiarities of modern Greek life. The general elections were at the moment pending. Monsieur Bulgaris had just a show, as the French say, and the king, after a crisis in which a rupture of the constitution had been expected, decided to try a constitutional experiment, and called to office Monsieur Jacopi an advanced radical in those days, and strongly opposed to the government. But Monsieur Tricopi was a highly educated and reasonable man, well acquainted with England and English politics, and apparently anxious to govern by strictly constitutional means. He has since proved himself, by his able and vigorous administration, one of the most remarkable statesmen in Europe, and the main cause of the progress of his country. His recent defeat, 1890, is therefore to be regarded as a national misfortune. Our new friend at Thebes was then the radical candidate, and was at the very time of our arrival canvassing his constituency. Every idle fellow in the town seemed to think it his duty to come up into his drawing room, in which we were resting, and sit down to encourage him and advise him. No hint that he was engaged in entertaining strangers had the smallest effect, 
noisy politics was inflicted upon us till the welcome announcement of dinner to which for a wonder his constituents did not follow him he told me that though all the country was strongly in favour of m chocopi yet he could hardly count upon a majority with certainty for he had determined to let the elections follow their own course and not control them with soldiers in this most constitutional country with its freedom as usual closely imitated from england soldiers stood at least up to the summer of eighteen seventy five round the booths and hustled out anyone who did not come to vote for the ministerial candidate m jacobi refused to take this traditional precaution and as the result showed lost his sure majority but when i was there and before the actual elections had taken place the radical party were very confident they were not only to come in triumphant but their first act was to be the prosecution of the late prime minister m bulgaris for violating the constitution and his condemnation to hard labour with confiscation of his property i used to plead the poor man's case earnestly with these hot-headed politicians by way of amusement and was highly edified by their arguments the ladies as usual were by far the fiercest and were ready like their goddess of old to eat the raw flesh of their enemies. I used to ask them whether it would not be quite out of taste if Mr. Disraeli, then in power, were to prosecute Mr. Gladstone for violating the Constitution in his Irish Church Act, and have him condemned to hard labor. The cases, they replied, were quite different. No Englishman could ever attain or even understand the rascality of the late Greek minister. Feeling that there might be some force in this argument, I changed ground, and asked them, were they not afraid that if he were persecuted in so violent a way he might, instead of occupying the opposition benches, betake himself to occupy the mountain passes, and, by robbing a few English travellers, so discredit the new government as to be worse and more dangerous in opposition than in power? No, they said. He will not do that. He is too rich. But, said I, if you confiscate his property, he will be poor. True, they replied, but still he will not be able to do it. He is too old. It seemed as if the idea that he might be too respectable never crossed their minds. What was my surprise to hear within six months that this dreadful culprit had come into power again at the head of a considerable majority we were afterward informed by a sarcastic observer that many of the greek politicians are paupers who will not dig and to beg they are ashamed and so they sit about the cafes of athens on the lookout for one of the ten thousand places which have been devised for the patronage of the ministry but as there are some thirty thousand expectants it follows that the twenty thousand disappointed are always at work seeking to turn out the ten thousand hence a crisis every three months hence a greek ambassador could hardly reach his destination before he was recalled hence too the exodus of all thrifty and hard-working men to smyrna to alexandria or to manchester where their energies were not wasted in perpetual political squabbling the greatest misconduct with which a man in office could be charged was the holding of it for any length of time. The whole public then join against him and cry out that it is high time for him, after so long an innings, to make way for someone else. It was not till M. Jacopi established his ascendancy that this ridiculous condition of things ceased. Whether in office or in opposition, he has a policy and retains the confidence of foreign powers. I had added, in the first edition of this book, some further observations on the apparent absurdity of introducing the British Constitution, or some parody of it, into every new state which is rescued from barbarism or from despotism. I am not the least disposed to retract what I then said 
generally but it is common justice to the greeks to say that later events are showing them to be among the few nations where such an experiment may succeed when the dangerous crisis of the turco-russian war supervened instead of rushing to arms as they were advised by some fanatical english politicians they set about to reform their ministry and feeling the danger of perpetually changing the men at the helm they insisted on the heads of the four principal parties forming a coalition under the nominal leadership of m canaros this great political move one of the most remarkable of our day was attempted as far as i can make out owing to the deliberate pressure of the country and from a solid interest in its welfare even though temporary in the present case it was an earnest that the greeks are learning national politics and that a liberal constitution is not wasted upon them there are many far more developed and important nations in europe which would not be capable of such a sacrifice of party interests and party ambition we left thebes very glad that we had seen it but not very curious to see it again its site makes it obviously the natural capital of the rich plain around it and we can also see at once how the larger and richer plain of orchomenus is separated from it by a distinct saddle of rising ground and was naturally in old times the seat of a separate power but the separation between the two districts which is not even so steep or well marked as the easy pass of daphne between athens and eleusis makes it also clear that the owners of either plain would certainly cast the eye of desire upon the possessions of their neighbors and so at an early epoch orchomenus was subdued for many reasons this may have been a disaster to greece the menia of orchomenus as people called the old nobles who settled there in prehistoric days were a great and rich society building forts and treasure houses and celebrated even in homer's day for wealth and splendor but perhaps owing to this very luxury they were subdued by the inartistic vulgar thebans who during the centuries of power and importance never rose to greatness save through the transcendent genius of pindar and of epaminondas no real greatness ever attached to their town when people came from a distance to see art in boeotia they came to little thespia in the southern hills where the eros of praxiteles was the pride of the citizens to Nagra too in the terracottas of which i have spoken shows taste and refinement and we still look with sympathy upon the strangely modern fashions of these graceful and elegant figures at thebes so far as i know no trace of fine arts has yet been discovered the great substructure of the cadmium the solid marble water pipes of their conduits a few inscriptions that is all it corroborates what we find in the middle and new comedy of the greeks that thebes was a place for eating and drinking a place for other coarse material comforts but no place for real culture or for art even their great poet pindar a poet in whom most critics find all the highest qualities of genius loftiness daring originality even this great man no doubt from the accidents of his age worked by the job and bargained for the payment of his noblest odes thus even in pindar there is something to remind us of his theban vulgarity and it is therefore all the more wonderful and all the more freely to be confessed that in epimenondas we find not a single flaw or failing and that he stands out as far the noblest of all the great men whom greece ever produced it were possible to maintain that he was also the greatest but this is a matter of opinion and of argument certain it is that his influence made thebes for the moment not only the leader in greek politics but the leader in greek society those of his friends whom we know seem not only patriots but gentlemen they cultivated with him music and eloquence nor did they despise philosophy so true is it that in this wonderful 
peninsula genius seem possible everywhere and that from the least cultivated and most vulgar town might arise a man to make all the world about him admire and tremble i will make but one more remark about this plain of boeotia there is no part of greece so sadly famed for all the battles with which its soil was stained the ancients called it mars's orchestra or exercising ground and even now when all the old life is gone and when not a hovel remains to mark the site of once well-built towns we may indeed ask why were these towns celebrated simply because in old greek history their names served to specify a scene of laughter where a campaign or it may be an empire was lost or won Plataea, Leuctra, Haliartus, Coronea, Caronia, Delium, Enophyta, Tanagra. These are in history the landmarks of battles, and with one exception, landmarks of nothing more. Thebes is mainly the nurse of the warriors who fought in these battles, and but little else. So then, we cannot compare Boeotia to the rich plains of Lombardy. They too, in their clay, I, and in our own day, Mars orchestra, for here literature and art have given fame to cities, while the battles fought around their walls have been forgotten by the world. I confess we saw nothing of the foggy atmosphere so often brought up against the climate of Boeotia, and yet it was then, of course, more foggy than it had been of old, for then the lake Copaes was drained whereas in 1875 the old tunnels, cut, or rather enlarged by the Maniae, were choked, and thousands of acres of the richest land covered with marsh and lake. It was M. Jacopi who promoted the plan of a French company to drain the lake more completely than even the old Catabothra had done, and, at the cost of less than one million sterling, to bring into permanent cultivation some thousands of acres, in fact, the largest and richest plain in all Greece. I asked him where he meant to find a population to till it, seeing that the present land was about ten times more than sufficient for the inhabitants. He told me that some Greek colonists who had settled in the north under the Turks or Servians, I forget which, were desirous of Hellenic liberty. It was proposed to give them the reclaimed tract. If these good people will reason from analogy, they will be slow to trust their fortunes to their old fellow countrymen. So long as they are indigent, they will be unmolested. Contabit vacu, vacuus corum latron viator. But as soon as they prosper, or are supposed to prosper, we might have the affair of Lorium repeated. The natives might be up in arms against the strangers who had come to plunder the land of the wealth intended by nature for others. The Greek parliament might be persuaded to make retrospective laws and restrictions, and probably all the more active and impatient spirits would leave a country where prosperity implied persecution, and where people only awake to the value of their possessions after they have sold them to others. What is now happening illustrates the views which I long since proposed. When the drainage works, completed in 1887, had uncovered rich tracts, the government laid claim to every acre of it, and endeavored to fence off the old riparian proprietors, they, on their side, disputed the new boundaries, and claimed what the government professed to have uncovered. Hence, no sale to new owners is as yet possible. The dispute is still, 1891, unsettled. I think jealousy no accidental feature, but one specially ingrained in the texture of Greek nature from the earliest times. Nothing can be a more striking or cogent proof of this than the way in which Herodotus sets down jealousy as one of the attributes of the deity. For the deities of all nations being conceptions formed after the analogy of human nature around them, there can be no doubt that the honest historian put it down as a necessary factor 
in the course and constitution of nature. We can only understand Greek history by keeping these things perpetually in mind, and even now it explains the apparent anomaly how a nation so essentially democratic, who recognize no nobility and no distinctions of rank, can be satisfied with a king of foreign race. They told me themselves over and over again that the simple reason was this. No Greek could tolerate another set over him, so that even such an office as president of a Greek republic would be intolerable if held by one of themselves. And this same feeling in old times is the real reason of the deadly hate manifested against the most moderate and humane despots. However able, however kindly, however great such a despot might be, however the state might prosper under him, one thing in him was intolerable. He had no natural right to be superior to his fellows, and yet he was superior. I will not deny the existence of political enthusiasm and of real patriotism among Greek tyrannicides, but I am quite sure that the universal sympathy of the nation with them was partly based upon this deep-seated feeling. It is said that, in another curious respect, the old and modern Greeks are very similar, I mean the form which bribery takes in their political struggles. It has been already observed and discussed by Mr. Freeman how, among the old Greeks, it was the politician who was bribed, and not the constituents, whereas among us in England the leading politicians are above suspicion, while the constituents are often corruptible enough. Our Theban friend told me that in modern Greece the ancient form of bribery was still in fashion, and that, except in Hydra and one other place, probably, if I remember rightly, Athens, the bribing of constituents was unknown while the taking of bribes by ministers was alleged not to be very uncommon. A few years ago, men of sufficient importance to be cabinet ministers were openly brought into court and indicted for the sale of three archbishoprics, those of Patras and Corinth among the number. There is no doubt that this public charge points to a sort of bribery likely to take place in any real democracy, when the men at the head of affairs are not men of great wealth and noble birth, but often ordinary or even needy persons, selected by ballot or popular vote, to fill for a very short time a very influential office. End of Section 9 Athens to Thebes by J. P. Mahaffey Section 10 of 1891 Collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Perard. 1891 Collection by Various. Section 10. Two Journal Entries. By Lafcadio Hearn. From The Diary of an English Teacher found in Glimpses of an Unfamiliar Japan. May 1st, 1891. My favorite students often visit me of afternoons. They first send me their cards to announce their presence. On being told to come in, they leave their footgear on the doorstep, enter my little study, prostrate themselves, and we all squat down together on the floor, which is in all Japanese houses, like a soft mattress. The servant brings zabuton, or small cushions, to kneel upon, and cakes, and tea. To sit as the Japanese do requires practice, and some Europeans can never acquire the habit. To acquire it, indeed, one must become accustomed to wearing Japanese costume. But once the habit of thus sitting has been formed, one finds it is the most natural and easy of positions, and assumes it by preference for eating, reading, smoking, or chatting. 
it is not to be recommended perhaps for writing with a european pen as the motion in our occidental style of writing is from the supported wrist but it is the best posture for writing with the japanese foot in using which the whole arm is unsupported and the motion from the elbow after having become habituated to japanese habits for more than a year i must confess that i find it now somewhat irksome to use a chair when we have all greeted each other and taken our places upon the kneeling cushions a little polite silence ensues which i am the first to break some of the lads speak a good deal of english they understand me well when i pronounce every word slowly and distinctly using simple phrases and avoiding idioms when a word with which they are not familiar must be used we refer to a good English Japanese dictionary, which gives each vernacular meaning, both in the kana and in the Chinese characters. Usually my young visitors stay a long time, and their stay is rarely tiresome. Their conversation and their thoughts are of the simplest and frankest. They do not come to learn. They know that to ask their teacher to teach out of school would be unjust. They speak chiefly of things which they think have some particular interest for me. Sometimes they scarcely speak at all, but appear to sink into a sort of happy reverie. What they come really for is the quiet pleasure of sympathy. Not an intellectual sympathy, but the sympathy of pure goodwill. The simple pleasure of being quite comfortable with a friend. They peep at my books and pictures, and sometimes they bring books and pictures to show me delightfully queer things, family heirlooms, which I regret much that I cannot buy. They also like to look at my garden and enjoy all that is in it even more than I. Often they bring me gifts of flowers. Never by any possible chance are they troublesome, impolite, curious, or even talkative courtesy in its utmost possible exquisiteness, an exquisiteness of which even the French have no conception, seems natural to the Izumo boy, as the color of his hair or the tint of his skin. Nor is he less kind than courteous. To contrive pleasurable surprises for me is one of the particular delights of my boys, and they either bring or cause to be brought to the house all sorts of strange things. Of all the strange or beautiful things which I am thus privileged to examine, none gives me so much pleasure as a certain wonderful kakemono of Amida Niore. It is a rather large picture, and has been borrowed from a priest that I may see it. The Buddha stands in the attitude of exhortation, with one hand uplifted. Behind his head a huge moon makes an aureole, and across the face of that moon stream winding lines of thinnest cloud. Beneath his feet, like a rolling of smoke, curl heavier and darker clouds. Merely as a work of color and design, the thing is a marvel, but the real wonder of it is not in color or design at all. Minute examination reveals the astonishing fact that every shadow and clouding is formed by a fairy text of Chinese characters so minute that only a keen eye can discern them. And this text is the entire text of two famed sutras, the Kwamu Rijo Kyo and the Amida Kyo, text no larger than the limbs of fleas. And all the strong dark lines of the figure such as the seams of the Buddha's robe, are formed by the characters of the holy invocation of the Shinshu sect, repeated thousands of times, Namu Amida Batsu. Infinite patience, tireless, silent labor of loving faith in some dim temple long ago. Another day, one of my boys persuades his father to let him bring to my house a wonderful statue of Koshi, Confucius, made, I am told, in China, 
toward the close of the period of the Ming dynasty. I am also assured it is the first time the statue has ever been removed from the family residence to be shown to anyone. Previously, whoever desired to pay it reverence had to visit the house. It is truly a beautiful bronze. The figure of a smiling, bearded old man, with fingers uplifted and lips apart as if discoursing, he wears quaint Chinese shoes, and his flowing robes are adorned with the figure of the mystic phoenix. The microscopic finish of detail seems, indeed, to reveal the wonderful cunning of a Chinese hand. Each tooth, each hair, looks as though it had been made the subject of a special study. Another student conducts me to the home of one of his relatives, that I may see a cat made of wood said to have been chiseled by the famed Hidari Jingoro, a cat crouching and watching, and so lifelike that real cats have been known to put up their backs and spit at it. Nevertheless, I have a private conviction that some old artists, even now living in Matsu, could make a still more wonderful cat. Among these is the venerable Arakawa Junosuke, who wrought many rare things for the daimyo of Izumo in the Tempo era, and whose acquaintance I have been enabled to make through my school friends. One evening he brings to my house something very odd to show me, concealed in his sleeve. It is a doll, just a small carven and painted head without a body, the body being represented by a tiny robe only attached to the neck. Yet, as Arakawa Jonosuke manipulates it, it seems to become alive. The back of its head is like the back of a very old man's head, but its face is the face of an amused child, and there is scarcely any forehead nor any evidence of a thinking disposition. And whatever way the head is turned, it looks so funny that one cannot help laughing at it. It represents a kirakubo, what we might call, in English, a jolly old boy, one who is naturally too hearty and too innocent to feel trouble of any sort. It is not an original, but a model of a very famous original, whose history is recorded in a faded scroll which Arikawa takes out of his other sleeve, and which a friend translates for me. This little history throws a curious light upon the simple-hearted ways of Japanese life and thought in other centuries. Two hundred and sixty years ago, this doll was made by a famous maker of no masks in the city of Kyoto, for the emperor Go Mizu no O. The emperor used to have it placed beside his pillow each night before he slept, and was very fond of it and he composed the following poem concerning it. Yo no naka wo kiraku ni kerase nani koto mo omo waniba koso. On the death of the emperor, this doll becomes the property of Prince Kanoyi, in whose family it is said to be still preserved. About 107 years ago, the then ex-empress, whose posthumous name is Sekwa Manin, borrowed the doll from Prince Kanoi, and ordered a copy of it to be made. This copy she kept always beside her, and was very fond of it. After the death of the good empress, this doll was given to a lady of the court, whose family name is not recorded. Afterwards, this lady, for reasons which are not known, cut off her hair and became a Buddhist nun, taking the name of Shingyo In, and one who knew the nun Shingyo In, a man whose name was Kondo Ju Haku in Hokyo, had the honor of receiving the doll as a gift. Now I, who write this document, at one time fell sick, and my sickness was caused by despondency, and my friend Kondo Ju Haku in Hokyo, coming to see me, said, I have in my house something which will make you well. And he went home, and presently returning, brought to me this doll and lent it to me, putting it by my pillow that I might see it and laugh at it. Afterward, 
I myself, having called upon the nun, Xingyo Ying, whom I now also have the honor to know, wrote down the history of the doll, and make a poem thereupon, dated about ninety years ago, no signature. June 1st, 1891. I find among the students a healthy tone of skepticism in regard to certain forms of popular belief. Science education is rapidly destroying credulity in old superstitions yet current among the unlettered, and especially among the peasantry, as, for instance, faith in Mamori and Ofuda. The outward forms of Buddhism, its images, its relics, its commoner practices, affect the average student very little. He is not, as a foreigner may be, interested in iconography or religious folklore, or the comparative study of religions. And in nine cases out of ten, he is rather ashamed of the signs and tokens of popular faith all around him. But the deeper religious sense, which underlies all symbolism, remains with him, and the monistic idea in Buddhism is being strengthened and expanded rather than weakened by the new education. What is true of the effect of the public schools upon the lower Buddhism is equally true of its effect upon the lower Shinto. The students all sincerely are, or very nearly all, yet not as fervent worshippers of certain kami, but as rigid observers of what the higher Shinto signifies, loyalty, filial piety, obedience to parents, teachers, and superiors, and respect to ancestors for Shinto means more than faith. When, for the first time, I stood before the shrine of the great deity of Kitsuki, as the first Occidental to whom that privilege had been accorded, not without a sense of awe there came to me the This is the shrine of the father of a race. This is the symbolic center of a nation's reverence for its past. And I, too, paid reverence to the memory of the progenitor of this people. As I then felt, so feels the intelligent student of the Meiji era, whom education has lifted above the common plane of popular creeds. And Shinto also means for him, whether he reasons upon the question or not, all the ethics of the family, and all that spirit of loyalty which has become so innate that, at the call of duty, Life itself ceases to have value, save as an instrument for duty's accomplishment. As yet, this Orient little needs to reason about the origin of its loftier ethics. Imagine the musical sense in our own race so developed that a child could play a complicated instrument so soon as the little fingers gained sufficient force and flexibility to strike the notes. By some such comparison only can one obtain a just idea of what inherent religion and instinctive duty signify in Izumo, of the rude and aggressive form of skepticism so common in the Occident, which is the natural reaction after sudden emancipation from superstitious belief. I find no trace among my students. But such sentiment may be found elsewhere, especially in Tokyo among the university students, one of whom, upon hearing the tones of a magnificent temple bell, exclaimed to a friend of mine, Is it not a shame that in this nineteenth century we must still hear such a sound? For the benefit of curious travellers, however, I may here take occasion to observe that to talk Buddhism to Japanese gentlemen of the new school is in just as bad taste as to talk Christianity at home to men of that class whom knowledge has placed above creeds and forms. There are, of course, Japanese scholars willing to aid researches of foreign scholars in religion or in folklore, but these specialists do not undertake to gratify idle curiosity of the globe-trotting description. I may also say that the foreigner, desirous to learn the religious ideas or superstitions of the common people, must obtain them from the people themselves, not from the educated classes. 
Among all my favorite students, two or three from each class, I cannot decide whom I like the best. Each has a particular merit of his own. But I think the names and faces of those of whom I am about to speak will longest remain vivid in my remembrance. Ishihara, Otani, Masanobu, Azuki Zawa, Yokoji, Ishida. Ishihara is a samurai, a very influential lad in his class because of his uncommon force of character. Compared with others, he has a somewhat brusque, independent manner, pleasing, however, by its honest manliness. He says everything he thinks, and precisely in the tone that he thinks it, even to the degree of being a little embarrassing sometimes. He does not hesitate, for example, to find fault with a teacher's method of explanation, and to insist upon a more lucid one. He has criticized me more than once, but I never found that he was wrong. We like each other very much. He often brings me flowers. One day, that he had brought two beautiful sprays of plum blossoms, he said to me, I saw you bow before our emperor's picture at the ceremony on the birthday of his majesty. You are not like a former English teacher we had. How? He said we were savages. Why? He said there is nothing respectable except God, his God, and that only vulgar and ignorant people respect anything else. Where did he come from? He was a Christian clergyman, and said he was an English subject. But if he was an English subject, he was bound to respect Her Majesty the Queen. He could not even enter the office of a British consul without removing his hat. I don't know what he did in the country he came from, but that was what he said. Now we think we should love and honor our emperor. We think it is a duty. We think it is a joy. We think it is happiness to be able to give our lives for our emperor. But he said we were only savages ignorant savages what do you think of that i think my dear lad that he himself was a savage a vulgar ignorant savage bigot i think it is your highest social duty to honor your emperor to obey his laws and to be ready to give your blood whenever he may require it of you for the sake of japan i think it is your duty to respect the gods of your fathers the religion of your country, even if you yourself cannot believe all that others believe. And I think, also, that it is your duty, for your emperor's sake and for your country's sake, to resent any such wicked and vulgar language as that you have told me of, no matter by whom uttered. Masanobu visits me seldom, and always comes alone. A slender, handsome lad, with rather feminine features, reserved and perfectly self-possessed in manner, refined. He is somewhat serious, does not often smile, and I never heard him laugh. He has risen to the head of his class, and appears to remain there without any extraordinary effort. Much of his leisure time he devotes to botany, collecting and classifying plants. He is a musician. Like all the male members of his family, he plays a variety of instruments never seen or heard of in the West, including flutes of marble, flutes of ivory, flutes of bamboo, of wonderful shapes and tones, and that shrill Chinese instrument called shō, a sort of mouth organ consisting of seventeen tubes of different lengths fixed in a silver frame. He first explained to me the uses in temple music of the taiku and shoko which are drums of the flutes called fei or teki of the flagellate termed ichiriki and of the kaku which is a little drum shaped like a spool with very narrow waist on great buddhist festivals masanobu and his father and his brothers are the musicians in the temple services and they play the strange music called ojo and bato music which at first no western ear can feel pleasure in but which when often heard becomes comprehensible 
and is found to possess a weird charm of its own. When Masanobu comes to the house, it is usually in order to invite me to attend some Buddhist or Shinto festival, Matsuri, which he knows will interest me. Azukizawa bears so little resemblance to Masanobu that one might suppose the two belong to totally different races. Azukizawa is a large, raw-boned, heavy-looking, with a face singularly like that of a North American Indian. His people are not rich. He can afford few pleasures, which cost money, except one, buying books. Even to be able to do this, he works in his leisure hours to earn money. He is a perfect bookworm, a natural-born researcher, a collector of curious documents, a haunter of all the queer second-hand stores in Teramachi and other streets where old manuscripts or prints are on sale as waste paper. He is an omnivorous reader and a perpetual borrower of volumes, which he always returns in perfect condition after having copied what he deemed of most value to him. But his special delight is philosophy and the history of philosophers in all countries. He has read various epitomes of the history of philosophy in the Occident, and everything of modern philosophy which has been translated into Japanese, including Spencer's first principles. I have been able to introduce him to Luz and John Fiske, both of which he appreciates, although the strain of studying philosophy in English is no small one. Happily, he is so strong that no amount of study is likely to injure his health and his nerves are tough as wire. He is quite an ascetic withal. As it is the Japanese custom to set cakes and tea before visitors, I always have both in readiness, and an especially fine quality of kwashi made at Kitsuki, of which the students are very fond. Azukizawa alone refuses to taste cakes or confectionery of any kind, saying, as I am the youngest brother, I must begin to earn my own living soon. I shall have to endure much hardship, and if I allow myself to like dainties now, I shall only suffer more later on. Atsukizawa has seen much of human life and character. He is naturally observant, and he has managed in some extraordinary way to learn the history of everybody in Matsu. He has brought me old, tattered prints to prove that the opinions now held by our director are diametrically opposed to the opinions he advocated fourteen years ago in a public address. I asked the director about it. He laughed and said, Of course, that is Azukizawa. But he is right. I was very young then. And I wonder if Azukizawa was ever young. Yokoji, Adzu Kizawa's dearest friend, is a very rare visitor, for he is always studying at home. He is always first in his class, the third-year class, while Adzu Kizawa is fourth. Adzu Kizawa's account of the beginning of their acquaintance is this. I watched him when he came and saw that he spoke very little, walked very quickly, and looked straight into everybody's eyes, so I knew he had a particular character. I like to know people with a particular character. Atsukizawa was perfectly right under a very gentle exterior. Yokoji has an extremely strong character. He is the son of a carpenter, and his parents could not afford to send him to the middle school. But he had shown such exceptional qualities while in the elementary school that a wealthy man became interested in him and offered to pay for his education. He is now the pride of the school. He has a remarkably placid face, with peculiarly long eyes and a delicious smile. In class, he is always asking intelligent questions, questions so original that I am sometimes extremely puzzled how to answer them, and he never ceases to ask until the explanation is quite satisfactory to himself. He never cares about the opinion of his comrades if he thinks he is right. 
on one occasion when the whole class refused to attend the lectures of a new teacher of physics yokoji alone refused to act with them arguing that although the teacher was not all that could be desired there was no immediate possibility of his removal and no just reason for making unhappy a man who though unskilled was sincerely doing his best Atsukizawa finally stood by him these two alone attended the lectures until the remainder of the students two weeks later found that yokoji's views were rational on another occasion when some vulgar proselytism was attempted by a christian missionary yokoji went boldly to the proselytizer's house argued with him on the morality of his effort and reduced him to silence some of his comrades praised his cleverness in the argument i am not clever he made answer it does not require cleverness to argue against what is morally wrong it requires only the knowledge that one is morally right at least such is about the translation of what he said as told me by Atsukizawa. shida another visitor is a very delicate sensitive boy whose soul is full of art he is very skilful at drawing and painting and he has a wonderful set of picture books by the old japanese masters the last time he came he brought some prints to show me rare ones fairy maidens and ghosts as i looked at his beautiful pale face and weirdly frail fingers i could not help fearing for him fearing that he might soon become a little ghost i have not seen him now for more than two months he has been very very ill and his lungs are so weak that the doctor has forbidden him to converse but Atsukizawa has been to visit him and brings me this translation of a japanese letter which the sick boy wrote and pasted upon the wall above his bed thou my lord soul dost govern me thou knowest that i cannot now govern myself deign i pray thee to let me be cured speedily do not suffer me to speak much make me to obey in all things the command of the physician this ninth day of the eleventh month of the twenty-fourth year of Meiji, from the sick body of Shida to his soul. End of section 10